Good evening. My name is James Kane, and I have the privilege to serve as your town moderator for this annual town meeting. Please rise and remain standing to join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As is our tradition, we will take a moment to remember the service of town meeting members who have passed away since we last met. Joseph J. Zecco, a 67-year resident of our town, passed away on March 31st. Mr. Zecco served as a member of the Sewer Commission from 1997 through 2020 and as a town meeting member from 1969 through 2019. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to our annual town meeting. To ensure good orders, tellers, please raise your hands so that all town meeting members can see you. All town meeting members should have their stickers clearly displayed so that all can see. Town meeting members should uh, also are asked to sit on this side of the tellers, on the downhill side. Only town meeting members should be on this side of the tellers unless provided with my specific permission. Residents wishing to enjoy the evening with us are asked to sit in the rear seating areas. All department heads are asked to sit to my lower left so as to be in a convenient location to answer questions. By way of reminder, our town meeting has a long and proud history of civil discourse and orderly debate. No outbursts in support or in opposition of a comment or a vote outcome are allowed. Furthermore, when one wishes to be recognized, please await my clear recognition and proceed to a microphone. If you are unable to get to a microphone, one will be provided to you. Once at the microphone, please clearly state your name and precinct and then proceed with your question. In order to ensure that all of your colleagues have an opportunity to speak, please limit your initial question to one with one follow-up if needed. Please hold additional questions until all others wishing to speak have, but have done so. Rest assured you will be recognized. At this time, I'd like to recognize those to my left and right. To my right, Town Clerk Sharon Thomas, Town Council Steve Madaus, Assistant Town Manager David Snowden. Our Finance Committee is further to my right, and I will ask its chair to introduce himself and his colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to introduce myself, Vikram Chabra, Chair of the Finance Committee. To my right, Dennis O'Connell, Clerk. The members of the committee to Mr. O'Connell's right are Jean Buddenhagen, Lena Polito, Melinda Kanekar, Diana Bowley, and James Flynn. Thank you. To my left, Town Manager Kevin Mizakar, and Chair of the Board of, of the Selector Board, and I will ask her to introduce herself and her colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I am Chair Beth Casavant, and I am joined by my colleagues, Vice Chair Teresa Flynn, Clerk John Samia, and members Michelle Conlin and Carlos Garcia. Thank you very much. With our introductions complete, let's get underway. Our town meeting operates under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the bylaws of the town of Shrewsbury, and town meeting time. I've examined the warrant and the constable's return of service. Both are in order. I ask for unanimous consent to dispense with the reading of the warrant and constable's return. Hearing no objection, it's voted unanimously. Town meeting members, I offer an additional procedural motion this evening regarding our meeting time and schedule. Uh, that this session of our annual town meeting adjourn each session at our town meeting at 10.30 p.m. or at the completion of any moved motion before us at 10.30 p.m. Hearing no objections, it's voted unanimously. Uh, to the town meeting warrant and report of the Finance Committee, on your way in this evening, you should have received a packet that includes the bundled items. Please recall that any bundling allows for one vote to cover such items included. 
If any town meeting member has questions regarding any bundled item, simply advise me of that and we will hold that out and obviously answer all of the questions. It's simply uh, asked to be uh, identify which one you want held and we will do so. As we walk through the warrant, I will call the article. The chair and vice chair of the select board will move the printed motion and second it. I will then ask the finance committee for its recommendation. And then under the burn rule, Mr. Mizakar will then provide a crisp, succinct description of the article under consideration. Article one. Motion under Article 1. Second. Article 1 has been moved and seconded. Finance Committee? The Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 1 by a vote of 7 to 0. Thank you. Mr. Mizakar? The report will be provided by Chair Fritz of the uh, Beale Early Childhood Center Building Committee. Sandy, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, town meeting members and residents of Shrewsbury. My name is Sandra Fritz, chair of the Bale Early Childhood Center Building Committee. I am pleased to provide you with our final report for this capital project. The building committee was formed by special town meeting on April 13th, 2016. Since the inception of this project, the committee regularly convened in its planning and oversight role and worked closely with the project team, including contractor Fontaine Brothers, architects Lamarro Pagano Associates, and the owner's project representative, PMA Consulting Group. The Major Howard Beale Elementary School at its new location at 214 Lake Street opened on September 24, 2021. Since the doors opened, students have benefited from learning in an environment that is not only aesthetically pleasing, but has the space and facilities needed to provide educational services to meet the needs of all students. The total project budget agreed upon with the Massachusetts School Building Authority was $92,002,159. To date, the town has received $30,836,611 in reimbursement from the MSBA. The final report from our owner's project manager indicates a total project spending of approximately $80,152,483. I'm extremely pleased to, re to report that the bill project was completed on time and at $11,849,676 under budget. The underage can be attributed to favorable market conditions at the time of the bid, prudent budgeting, a thorough design plan leading to very few change orders and solid project management. The members of the bill building committee and the entire project team are to be commended for the excellent management of this project to complete it on schedule and keep it under budget despite many challenges, including the coronavirus pandemic. The bill school building project is an incredibly good news story for our town and our taxpayers. The new school is modern, environmentally friendly and incorporates sustainable building systems. It is a cost-effective, long-term solution that meets the community and the school district's program, space, and educational needs now and in the future. Thank you again to town meeting members and the residents of Shrewsbury for their support of this important capital project. Thank you for your attention. Comments or questions with reference to Article 1? Not seeing any. Is there a motion to accept the report? All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Article 1 is complete. Article 2. I move the printed motion under Article 2. Second. Finance Committee. Mr. Moderator, the Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 2. Mr. Mizaka. This article would establish a fund within the town's accounting system to receive donations to prepare for the celebration of the town's 300th anniversary. Comments or questions with reference to Article 2? Not seeing any. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The article passes unanimously. Article 3. I move the printed motion under Article 3. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 3 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizakar. This is a standing article that's considered every annual town meeting in accordance with the trust that was established uh, through the Wright and Harlow Charitable Trust Fund. Comments or questions with reference to Article 3? Yes. <clears throat> it's on. 
Can you turn on the mic, please, Mark? <laughs> Just a second. Thank you. Nope. Try again, please. Uh, well, there you go. Here we go. Dating Gun at Precinct 2. Can I ask what this charitable fund is? Actually, a family member contacted me and asked me. They came across it after the family member passed away. and. They were just curious what it is and what it does. Mr. Mizikar. My recollection, it is uh, funds that were raised to support the education of the poor within the community. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 3? Not seeing or hearing any. All those in favor of Article 3 shall signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Article 4. I move the printed motion under Article 4. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 4 unanimously. Mr. Mizikar. This article seeks town meetings authorization to have the select board petition the state legislature to grant special legislation for purposes of abating real estate taxes for the domicile of Ava Roy. Ms. Roy is the daughter of fallen Worcester firefighter Christopher Roy. Christopher and Ava were residents of Shrewsbury at the time he was tragically killed <clears throat> fighting a fire. Ava's grandparents are her guardians and have moved to Shrewsbury and are raising her here. This special legislation would allow us to grant this benefit, exempting their property from real estate taxes, taxes until Ava turns age 26, since the general laws of the Commonwealth do not currently have the ability to do so. Questions or comments with reference to Article 4? Not seeing or hearing any. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Article 5. I move the printed motion under Article 5. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 5 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizikar. This article allows us to pay a bill from a prior year uh, in accordance with the general laws, Chapter 44, Section 64, uh, if a bill is received beyond the time that the financial books are closed, we must come back to town meeting and seek your approval. Uh, we received the bill late in September for fiscal year 22, and we're asking town meeting's approval to pay it. Article 5 requires a four-fifths vote. Any further comments or questions with reference to Article 5? Not hearing or seeing any. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Article 6. I move the substitute motion under Article 6. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 6 by a vote of 6 to 0. Does everybody have the substitute motion? I believe it's on yellow. Mr. Mizikar. So we are seeking to make adjustments to the fiscal year 23 or the current budget. Town meeting holds budgetary authority within the personnel line items and expense line items separately uh, and without your approval we're not allowed to move funds between them and let, uh, so we've brought this item uh, for your consideration uh, the vast majority of expenses are related to uh, increases in utility costs and chemical costs within our uh, utility operational departments uh, within the Department of Public Works Business Management Division we're seeking to use a, a contractor which would fall under an expense category in lieu of a staff member uh, who departed to fill that um, service need. Within the town manager's office, we're seeking to move funds to cover unanticipated inf inflationary expenses, advertising costs, and um, to acquire additional furniture with the, uh, associated uh, with filling the assistant town manager for operations position. Questions or comments with reference to the substitute motion under Article 6? Sir? Yes, Maduk Mishra, um, Precinct 4. I had a question around the, the public buildings expenses and wanted to understand a little bit more about the unforeseen utility costs. Thank you. Mr. Mizikar? 
Um, generally speaking, and I'm happy to provide more detail, uh, we've experienced roughly a 56% cost increase in our utility expenses, mainly electricity from the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, when we were budgeting uh, last year at this time, we made our best estimate, and because those rates have increased significantly, we didn't have sufficient funds within those line items to cover the balance of the year. So we're seeking to move those funds within the department down to the appropriate line items to be able to cover those costs. So this includes utility costs, costs across all buildings, including municipal and school facilities. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 6? Not hearing or seeing any. It's requiring a majority vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? It carries. Article 7. I move the printed motion under Article 7. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 7 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizakar. The special purpose override stabilization fund was set up to stabilize finances within the operating budget uh, <coughs> with the passage of the May of 2021 operational override. Through this article, we seek to deposit additional million dollars into the override stabilization account. Uh, current figures are provided within the description of the article. In general, we uh, foresee an additional year being able to be added. So when we went to the voters, we committed to uh, not asking for another operating override for, for at least four years, uh, and it's clear now that we can go at least five years without op asking for an additional operational override. Questions or comments with reference to Article 7? Not hearing or seeing any. All those in favor of Article 7, so signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Article 7 carries. Article 8. I move the printed motion under Article 8. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 8 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizaka. So this article was perhaps the most consequential matter for consideration by town meeting as it sets the priorities for the upcoming fiscal year by allocating the majority of financial resources that are available us, for us for expenditure. This budget is the outcome of months of work by municipal and school staff, the select board and school committee, and is the outcome of more than 10 hours of public hearings by the finance committee. Municipal budgets were established with direct ties to the priorities established in the 2030 strategic plan. New initiatives have been muted due to inflationary pressures. However, there are additional investments that I would like to highlight. In public safety departments, a police lieutenant and four additional firefighters are included. A communications coordinator position has been established to improve information sharing, outreach, and engagement. Finally, an additional position within the Recreation Department is included to help build more programming and opportunities for all residents. Beyond staffing, the budget targets critical investments to modernize and digitize our operations with a resident-centric approach, expand communication and reporting on performance, and maintain quality of life programs, development initiatives, regulatory oversight, and critical infrastructure. The entire town leadership team is here this evening to answer any questions you may have. Just a note that utility operations are considered in subsequent articles, and we look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mizakar. As has been our practice, we will now walk through Article 8. I will call the page, and then the specific item uh, and the entity within town hall. So we're starting on 11, where we had the article uh, in its commencement with the motion and the sources and the body of the uh, motion on page 12. I'm now on 13. Any questions on page 13, 119, personnel board? Yes, sir, Mr. Sigilnik, I believe. John Segelnik, Precinct 2. Um, this question is not related to any particular account, but on the overall budget. On, on page 2, I can't open my book, but on page 2. Uh, page down, 2 of the report of the Finance Committee, John? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. 
We are referencing page two in the report of the Finance Committee. Uh, near the bottom, it says account transfers for $5,359,000. I, I guess the wording account transfers infers the money's coming from other accounts that are somewhere on, on the ledger. So, so basically my question is, where, where is the money coming from, part one? In part two, it, it sounds like this is a one-time deal that we wouldn't have money to transfer in next year's budget. And, and therefore, next year's budget would be star a starting point would be $5 million less than this year. It, would that put us in some sort of uh, funding hole? Mr. Mizikar. So uh, the chart on page two encapsulates all financial transactions that will occur throughout all 54 Warren articles at town meeting, not just Article 8, the budget. The, the account transfers are associated with non-operating budget matters. Uh, the vast majority of those funds, roughly $3.5 million, are funds that are being transferred, which were originally borrowed for the Beal elementary school construction project and move to other capital improvement projects. So this, again, this page is just not associated with the budget. It's all financial transactions. You'll notice that the total here is uh, almost 180 million and the operating budget in and of itself is only 148. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 8 Page 13, 119, Personnel Board. Ms. Nichols. Um, Dina Nichols, Precinct 7. Just to make sure I understand um, a little bit back, retroing back to um, the substitute motion for Article 6. So on that particular, and how We're, it ties into just our- Just a second, our, Dina. We're done with 6. No, I know that. But I just want to make sure I'm, I'm tying it to the current article, if that's okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so we were transferring money from salary accounts to um, other accounts to cover utility costs that had gone up about 56% unanticipated, correct? So in this budget that we're approving right now, are those transfers that were done, um, is the number that we're looking at here under the salaries, is that sort of um, replacing those funds so it brings it back to full again? Mr. Mezikar? So when we, when we turn the books on July 1 from June 30, everything for fiscal year 23 is kind of locked away and we can't use it moving forward. Um, so you have to think of those Article 6 and Article 8 as two separate financial sets of transactions because they are and they can't cross. What we're doing with this budget is making our best estimates at this time. So all salary and wage line items have sufficient funding for the entire fiscal year. And we believe all operating expense line items have the same. And I say we believe because if for some instance utility costs would go up by more than we've estimated, although we have increased them significantly in this budget, which we can get to in public buildings, uh, we would have to make a adjustments if we didn't have enough. But this, all the pages uh, coming forward for the operating budget, we do believe is sufficient for the entire 12 months from July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2024. Okay, and uh, thank you for explaining that. Um, I guess the other general, uh, simple question I would have on page 13, um, what are the new salary schedules? And I apologize if I missed that somewhere along the line. So that, Mr. Mizica. Thank you. That line item is used um, to adjust employees' compensation, mainly non-union employees, uh, although we use it for any contracts that are under negotiation as well uh, for cost of living and performance. So uh, these funds will eventually, uh, under the authorization and approval of the personnel board, be moved throughout the other departmental line items to fund cost of living adjustments and any performance increases uh, associated with the fiscal 23 performance of employees. So those adjustments go into place on July 1. So it, it eventually gets spread among all the departments. Thank you. 
Page 13, 119 Personnel Board. 13, 122 Select Board. 14, pay, uh, item 123 Town Manager. Four, what? Oh, yes, Ms. Hollenbeck, how are you? Melissa Hollenbeck, Precinct 9. So this is actually on uh, regarding town manager and human resources, kind of like a big question. Um, so as I'm looking at the costs going on into the future, I'm not seeing a lot of increases. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is there are a lot of changes within municipalities as far as being able to retain and to attract top talent. Do we have any game plan for that? And is, um, you know, is anything going to be reflected within HR? Also, with um, regard to HR, are we seeing any possibility of um, trainings and development programs revol uh, re regarding climate change, diversity, equity, um, more types of things that are really bringing Shrewsbury uh, Municipal Offices to the 21st century and preparing for it? Mr. Mizikar. Yeah, I can uh, take a crack at that and have our human resources director augment if you wish. Um, so a, a number of things. So a couple of years ago, we requested from this body the, the ability to change our personnel bylaws and move to a performance-based system away from what most other municipalities do, which is a step-based or tenure-based system. Uh, we feel that we can uh, compensate staff members for the work that they do and, and retain uh, our staff better because we're incentivizing their performance. Um, we are also uh, working diligently in soliciting information from our staff. Uh, we issue uh, surveys uh, roughly twice a year to gather feedback about uh, programs that we offer um, and ways that we can help keep them happy. Uh, everyone knows that the public sector isn't the highest paying sector. We try to work around the edges uh, we recently changed operating hours of most core municipal buildings uh, with a longer Tuesday evening and a shorter Friday to provide some incentive because we don't have the ability to offer remote work uh, for most uh, positions. Uh, we're offering additional supplemental benefits that employees can choose to take on to provide some financial peace of mind. Um, those will go into effect throughout fiscal year 23. Uh, when it comes to um, additional trainings. Uh, we're developing what we're referring to as the Shrewsbury Way, which is an internal training academy that we use to develop uh, and educate staff across a variety of uh, different uh, topic areas, including diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, climate uh, that you referenced. We have a leadership academy and we're, we'll also be excited to be externally facing with a resident academy and junior police academy through those programs. So we are doing everything that we can to be as competitive in the marketplace as we can, knowing that salary uh, and wages isn't always uh, the easiest place for us to be when we're uh, facing competition from the outside. I do feel that we're moving in the right direction, especially uh, when it comes to competing against other municipalities. Uh, we see that through recent uh, job postings and being able to solicit and receive applications from top talent across the region and the Commonwealth. Thank you. Further comments or questions with reference to page 14, town manager, one, two, three, human resources, one, two, five. We'll now move to page 15, item 131, finance committee, and item 135, accountant. Yes, sir. Chief Papu, Precinct 4. I have a question on the Finance Committee. Do yes. you don't mind sharing what the Reserve Fund is? Mr. Mizikar. Sure. The Reserve Fund is um, this line item within the budget that gives us some flexibility throughout the course of the year for the Finance Committee to meet and review uh, challenges that department have for unexpected or unforeseen circumstances that impact their budgets financially. 
it is our only set of funds that can be reappropriated out of the budget without coming back to town meeting. So the Finance Committee has discretion over this 250000 for fiscal year 24 to assist any budgets if they have any shortfalls. Further comments or questions with reference to page 15, Finance Committee or 135 Accountant? Yes, Ms. Harrington, I believe. Maureen Harrington, Precinct 1. Just a question for the town manager regarding that $250,000 sum the Finance Committee has. How long has that been in place? And what was last year's amount? Uh, the fiscal 23 appropriation is $305,000. Um, it's roughly been the same amount uh, over the course of the last 10 plus years. Uh, we can normally manage within that range. We, we do our best in the budget process and uh, have two opportunities, this meeting and the fall town meeting, to make adjustments with you all, with the full body. So we try to limit the uh, amount of funds that are placed into this count and have been successful uh, at this level recently. Further comments or questions with reference to page 15, 131 Finance Committee, 135 Accountant. Not hearing or seeing any. We'll move to page 16, 141 Assessors, 145 Treasurer Collector. We'll move to page 17, Town Council, 151, and Town Clerk, 161. We'll now move to page 18, 162, Election and Registration. 171, Conservation Commission. We'll move to page 19, 174, Planning and Economic Development. And 175, Planning Board. We'll now move to page 20. The Board of Appeals, 176. 192, Public Buildings, on page 20. Page 21, the Police Department, 210. The fire department, 220, on page 21. We'll now move to page 22. Building inspector, 241. And the weights and measures, 244. Page 23. 291, Emergency Management. 294, Forestry. Page 24, what, I'm sorry, Ms. Hollenbach. Lisa Hollenbach, Precinct 9. Um, does the forestry budget, would that also potentially in the future be including, um, would, I'll talk louder, um, in, the, in the future would possibly the forestry department also be including um, things like costs for um, um, an inventory of tr the tree, things that we're looking at um, in the, uh, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. So I wanted to know more if it's going to be more looking forward uh, to planting and keeping our trees rather than uh, just kind of cutting them down. Mr. Mizikar. Uh, DPW Director Howland, if I may, Mr. Mr. Howland, DPW Director. Uh, Jeff Howland, DPW Director, yes it will. Actually last year in FY23 budget we added uh, a tree assessment line item and also a tree planting item, so it's a, uh, which we merged uh, funds from public buildings, uh, parks, and parks maintenance, and forestry. Thank you, Jeff. 
Further comments or questions with respect to Article 8, page 23, forestry? Oh, good, good evening. Please. Martha Deering, Precinct 4. I noticed on all the other articles we've got equipment less trade zero 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 zero, but under emergency management equipment less trade is ninety five hundred dollars. Could somebody explain, please, what that item is and why that one has numbers and the others do not? Certainly, Mr. Mizikar. Sure. This is uh, for a regular acquisition that we make into our emergency communication system. So most apartments we handle equipment purchases uh, more significantly through the capital improvement plan. Uh, emergency management, uh, we make this annual appropriation through its operating budget. Further comments or questions with reference to page 23, 291 emergency management, 294 forestry. Mm -hmm. Not seeing any, we'll move on to 24, 310, other post employee benefits. Yes, sir. Chief Papu Precinct 4, what's the nature of the separately independent APPR accounts? Mr. Mizikar. Could, could you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Uh, what, what type of accounts? Yeah, what are, what's included in those expenses? Oh, separate. So this is uh, what is referred to as a nine account. So it allows funds to uh, be placed into this line item and not transferred for any other purpose for any other type of expense. So we use that um, where statute allows. It also in some instances allow us to carry funds forward from one fiscal year to another, but that is not the case uh, within these line items. So um, it again just allows us to dedicate those funds for one particular purpose. I don't know if uh, Ms. Lee, the town accountant, may have additional uh, explanation about the nine accounts, but. Did that answer your question? Uh, not necessarily. What is the money used for? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so other post-employment benefits is health insurance cost of retirees. So this is our contribution as an employer. We pay 50% uh, of employees employee uh, health insurance costs after, obviously after they retire. So perhaps one suggestion would be if you could show the money being transferred every year going to that line item of health insurance and then the amount that comes in, so that way we could see how much is being spent, how much is being saved, and how much is being added to it on a so, year-to-year basis. So these funds actually go into a trust fund uh, to be used in the future for those purposes. Uh, the, the current year's payments are actually paid out of the health insurance line item. Further comments or questions with reference to page 24, 310, other post-employee benefits? Moving down to 311, pensions. Moving to page 25, 410, Public Works Administration. 411, Town Engineer. To page 26, 415, Fleet Maintenance. 421, Highway. Page 27, 424, street lighting. 491, cemeteries. Page 28, parks maintenance. 310, 510, health. Page 29, 541, Council on Aging. 543, Veterans Services. Page 30, 
Commission on Disabilities. Yes, Ms. Nichols. Hi, sorry to uh, back us up again, but on page 27, cemeteries. I know we have an upcoming article that's gonna be discussing the expansion of the cemetery um, over to Prospect Park. And I was just wondering, based on what we're budgeting this year, and based on the spending history up until this point, are any of the funds, I'm presuming they'd be added expense incurred in the upcoming year for that uh, potential expansion? Um, or is that gonna be a, a bit down the road? I was just wondering why things looked pretty Mr. Mizikar. So all the funds that are required and associated with the expansion will come through that Warren article and that appropriation if approved. This uh, handles the day-to-day -day costs uh, throughout the year in, in maintaining the area and, and operating the office. Okay, so once that um, is added, any added, we don't anticipate any added expenses in terms of maintenance, et cetera, over the <coughs> upcoming year, presumably. Uh, Mr. Mizikar? So the, if approved this evening, the new cemetery, you know, wouldn't be constructed and operational until fiscal year 26. Okay. So um, the maintenance of the grounds will cost us more as we expand, you know, to those 19 acres. Um, and we will have that full cost estimate in the coming fiscal years. Great. So that's all been factored in for the future. Thank you. Not in this particular time. Thanks. We are on page three zero, Commission on Disabilities. Page three zero five six one zero, Library. Page thirty one, Recreation. Page thirty one, Debt. Page 32, long-term debt total interest. Page 33, short-term debt total. For, uh, square through page 33, we will now go on page 34, 35, to the school department, FY 2024 budget recommendation. I would ask, I would ask the chair of the school committee to step forward and introduce her colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, town meeting members. My name, again, is Sandra Fritz, and I'm the chair of the Shoesbury School Committee. On behalf of my colleagues, Erin Boucher, John Wensky, Lindsay Heffernan, and Rachel Shrevapur, I am pleased to be here tonight to present to you the school department budget request for fiscal year 2024. The school committee voted unanimously to recommend a town-appropriated fiscal year 24 budget of $83,086,622 which represents a $3,767,651 increase over the current fiscal year, or an increase of 4.75%. The school department's goals for the fiscal year 24 budget recommendation is to maintain fiscal stability while addressing student learning gaps, district strategic goals and priorities, and rising costs. This is the third fiscal year since the operational override was passed in 2021. The FY24 budget recommendation aligns with the school committee's agreement with the select board, which provides a baseline school department annual budget increase of 4.25%, with the potential for growth beyond that up to a maximum of 4.75% if additional revenue is forecast. The school department's recommended budget increase of 4.75% for fiscal year 24 is based upon the town revenue projected by Mr. Mizikar. While the district enjoys fiscal certainty due to the 2021 override funding, careful assessment and prudent, thoughtful use of all available funds were at the forefront of our budget consideration process. 
The committee and district leadership met multiple times in budget workshops to discuss the district needs and priorities to ensure budget recommendations align with the recently completed strategic plan for 2023 through 2027 and its impact on identified areas of need as well as accomplishing the district's educational goals. A review and update of the district's literacy program was in the planning stage as the pandemic hit. A program review highlighted the need to examine our practices and consider updates to the methods and materials. The district's adoption of the STAR assessment, a universal screening tool, and the MCAS results indicated that while students are recovering from pandemic learning loss, it also revealed losses in English language arts. The data reinforced that additional work is needed to empower all students to meet grade level standards in literacy. The FY24 budget recommendation includes the following strategic investments to focus on shifting current practice and programs in literacy instruction to match current research and best practices and to close identified learning gaps and meet a critical academic need. It includes adding one reading specialist at Sherwood Middle School to provide reading intervention and instruction for students and to support staff in updating literacy instructional practices. It includes read two reading specialists for the kindergarten through grade four level to provide reading intervention for students reading below benchmark and coordinate literacy tutor interventions and provide coaching and job embedded professional development. It also includes one literacy or reading consultant for the school year of 2023-2024. This is a temporary contracted employee, a one-time investment to provide coaching and job embedded professional development for K through four leaders and educators to support training and implementation of updated literacy instructional practices and programming. Expanding the high school students' opportunities in career technical education is another major focus in the FY24 budget. Due to recent regulations adopted by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and Assabet Valley Regional Technical High School, the opportunity for Shrewsbury students to attend vocational school is very limited. Last fall, in a joint letter from the school committee and select board, we contacted the Assabet Valley Regional School Committee to inquire if they would consider allowing the town of Shrewsbury to join their vocational technical high school district so that Shrewsbury students would have better access to Assabet. In late February, they voted to refrain from considering any expansion of their own district's membership towns at the current time. This decision and lack of ability for those students who desire a traditional vocational school experience undoubtedly have a detrimental effect on educational services. During the fiscal 24 budget discussions, the school committee strongly advocated for additional investment in career and technical education options for students to mitigate the current situation. The district's recently completed project plan, excuse me, strategic plan for 2018 through 2022 included the priority of connected learning for a complex world. There, have been on, there has been ongoing work in the district since 2018 to provide opportunities that help students develop independence after graduation, including exposure to career choices and the development of skills in financial literacy in building community partnerships with businesses, institutions, and individuals to increase access to learning and career awareness and to enhance learning in the STEAM fields of science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. The district's newly adopted 2023 through 2027 strategic plan includes the goal of advancing career and technical education for all students, post-secondary preparedness, by expanding access to career and technical education, evaluating course offerings, and exploring career pathway opportunities. This updated goal builds on the work to create a roadmap to provide all students with enhanced career and technical educational opportunities. Career Technical Education, or CTE, provides students with the academic and technical skills, knowledge, and training needed to succeed in future careers. Vocational education goes beyond CTE and focuses on one particular vocational area. Our district cannot replicate the type of intensive vocational education a student would receive if they were to attend ASABIT. Shrewsbury Public Schools has been and will continue to work to increase CTE opportunities to mitigate the educational effects due to the lack of available spots at traditional vocational schools and provide various learning experiences for all students. During the past school year, the district has done the following to advance CTE options. 
Shrewsbury High School leadership and counseling teams have identified career pathway course sequence options for rising grade 10 and grade 9 students interested in CTE beginning with the 23-24 school year. The pathway sequences were offered first to incoming 9th and 10th grade students who applied to ACIBIT and were not admitted due to the new policy change. The pathways include full year course offerings organized into six content specific pathways including biomedical, business, child care, computer science, engineering, and TV production and film. They mimic the structure of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's innovation pathways. Over 60 rising grade 10 and grade 9 students have enrolled in a career pathway that interests them while having the flexibility to transition from one pathway to another if their interests change. The district is in the process of actively pursuing innovation career pathway designation through DESE. The district is seeking $625,000 in funding through the process of applying for a state career pathways expansion planning grant to support expansion and student access to the program and to help address the current community need for CTE. District leadership met with the leadership team at the Blackstone Valley Hub for Workforce Development to better understand opportunities for in-district and out-of-district internships, apprenticeships, job shadowing, and employment. The Blackstone Hub aims to actively contribute to a collaborative workforce pipeline by providing a centralized location for students to gain technical and employability skills needed to meet the region's and workforce needs. We believe this potential partnership holds great promise for providing technical training opportunities for Shrewsbury High students in fields such as computer integrated manufacturing and welding. District leadership and educators have collaborated to create, assess, and strengthen career and life readiness for all students through career exploration. Opportunities include career fairs, job fairs, job shadowing, short and long term internships, in classroom speaker series facilitated by the Shrewsbury Public Schools alums town officials and others to provide a connection between college, career, and the workforce to illustrate ways in which a student's strengths, interests, and academic skills can translate into the job market and what steps they need to take to reach their goals. Identification of individuals, companies, and organizations willing to work with students to share their purpose and goals and mission. And there is a regular update and maintenance of the district's job for students website to share op opportunities throughout the year including contact information for local businesses and alumni that seek student involvement in, and engagement. The fiscal year 24 budget includes additional investment to implement the key strategic priority of career technical education. It includes one science and engineering teacher at Shrewsbury High. This position redirects vocational technical tuition for expansion of access to project lead the way courses, course offerings in technical subject matters including biomedical science, intro to engineering principles, robotics, electronics, and exploring technology. There is also 100,000 in investment to expand career and technical education opportunities. It is not possible to flip a switch so students can have the same or similar experiences they would have had at a traditional tech, vocational technical high school. The work the district has done and continues to do provide, to provide learning experiences for all students is multifaceted and challenging. A careful and deliberate assessment of students' learning needs and desires, as well as space, equipment, personnel, and transportation are critical to ensure the right opportunities are being provided to students and the program is sustainable long term. As we look to the future, the district will need to carefully assess the space, staffing, equipment, and financial needs to further increase student access to, to career technical opportunities. <clears throat> Over the past year, the issue of school building space in is an area the school department has examined carefully in partnership with the municipal leaders. A pre-K through grade 12 space and enrollment study was funded as part of the Bill School Feasibility Study. Physical space is necessary for the district to expand academic programming, including electives or any new educational offerings. The in-depth study identified Shrewsbury High School as the current highest priority due to its status as significantly overcrowded based on the difference between its design capacity and enrollment. The school committee and select board met in two workshop sessions to discuss the space study report and next steps. 
the school committee and select board voted unanimously to support a statement of interest, a non-binding submittal to the Massachusetts School Building Authority seeking grant funding to add space at the high school. The partnership between cities and towns in the MSBA is essential for school capital projects and provides significant cost savings to taxpayers. However, this is a very highly competitive process with limited annual funding, and we will not likely find out the status of our submission until later this year or early in 2024. The district's creation of an in-house RISE program, which stands for Reaching Independence Through Supported Employment, will allow us to keep students aged 18 through 22 in district in their own community and receive a high-quality program at the same or lesser cost. The property at 557 Main Street was secured through the legally required competitive procurement process. The district has entered into a five-year lease that will commence upon completion of renovations. This new initiative will also free up some minimal space at the high school, however, is far from fi a fix to the space challenges there, but does provide some small additional capacity in the short term. The second priority that the space study brought forward is the need to address in some combination the age and condition of the Coolidge School and the amount and quality of space for district's preschool program. And the third priority is to provide parity among our K through four elementary schools. At our school committee meeting on August 26, Dr. Sawyer suggested the formation of a study committee to review the recommendations in the space study report regarding pre-K through grade four capital needs. The plan is for the formation of the study committee to be completed by the end of the summer. Meetings will convene throughout the, uh, the fall and winter, and recommendations to address preschool and elementary capital investments will be presented to the school committee in March of next year. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts and work continue to be part of our district's daily practices. The district has invested in ongoing DEIB work in a variety of ways, including professional development for staff, initiation of teacher diversification project to assist with hiring practices, use of data to inform instructional practices to meet the diverse needs of students, focusing on a culture of belonging, and engaging families with diverse backgrounds. During this past year, Dr. Sawyer and Ms. Clowder participated in an intensive professional institute through their state association that focused on advancing educational equity for all students and all central office leaders and principals participated in training focused on the districts, focused on reducing the achievement gaps. During the development of the district's new strategic priorities for 23 through 27, the consensus was that there should not be a standalone priority for DEIB as it should be embedded in everything we do as a district. A critical initiative the district will pursue in FY24 is hiring a third party to assist with an updated equity audit. Reevaluation of our work to date is vital to assess where we, are, where we are doing well and where tweaks need to be done to ensure the district is doing all it can to incorporate an appreciation of diversity in our schools, curriculum, and daily practices. Other key areas for strategic investment in the FY24 budget recommendation include a safety and security audit. The district will hire contract services to perform a comprehensive review and report of all district schools regarding safety and security related to building infrastructure and emergency response practices. Funding for attendance and residency validation services, the district will hire contracted services to manage attendance issues and residency validation for student enrollment. And finally, funding for strategic plan implementation and monitoring, the district will hire contracted services for consultation to ensure development of a robust action plan and data tracking systems for successful implementation of our district strategic plans for 23 through 27. Strong public schools add value to our community and our taxpayers. The fiscal year 24 budget recommendation reflects targeted investment in key district priorities and needs that will provide the best educational experience possible for all students. It follows the commitment made to the community that the school department will work within the promised override framework. It reflects prudent, thoughtful use of financial resources provided by the taxpayers. On behalf of the school committee and the central office team, I would like to express our sincere appreciation and gratitude to the select board Finance Committee, Mr. Mizakar, town meeting members, and the Shrewsbury community for your continued investment and commitment to public education. Thank you for your time and attention, and I respectfully request your support of the school department's fiscal year 24 budget. 
I'm happy to answer any questions and ask that Dr. Soria or Mr. Collins please join me. And I'd like to make sure everybody knows that this is Mr. Collins' last town meeting in his official role as he will be retiring from the school department. Further comments? Mm -hmm. or further? Further comments or questions with reference to Article 8, specifically the school department budget down front here, sir? Rajesh Vareo, Puti, Precinct 10. So what would be the financial impact of the Asabet Valley fallout? So students staying in school and then they're going to the other alternative courses like uh, Innovation Pathways or uh, Blackstone Valley. So did we consider the budget implications associated to that? With the tuition savings right. that were coming in? Yep. Tuition okay. savings and also the spend, extra spend with transportation. Right. No. And Mr. Collins wants to take that. Oh, Mr. Dr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mr. Villagaputi. Uh, in terms of the uh, budget expense that's listed uh, in the documents you received, uh, the uh, school district is setting aside $100,000 uh, for next year uh, around some of these expenses. Uh, in terms of the, uh, some of the partnerships we're exploring with the Blackstone Hub, for example, uh, we, we don't know exactly what the price tag could be potentially to access some of those services. We're in active discussions with them. Um, we do have some internal transportation that's available already from vans we already own um, in terms of bringing students down uh, potentially for um, some training there or, or some uh, informational sessions. Um, there was a report made on this uh, full report to the school committee actually at their last meeting, which is available on our website um, if people are interested. I, think, I believe I sent that link out in my last update. Um, I think the, the key is that um, the budget that's before you this evening uh, certainly provides all the resources to educate the students who will be at Shrewsbury High School who otherwise would not have been if they'd been at Assabet. Um, and it also provides us with opportunities to expand by adding a staff member at Shrewsbury High School, the Project Lead the Way programming that's hands-on engineering, biomedical, variety of courses, um, so that all of our students who are asking for access to those courses um, are able to get access. Um, and that also as part of the uh, pathways, uh, career pathways course sequences that the uh, high school identified for students who are current ninth graders and current eighth graders uh, who can start to take these sequences of courses. So that's built into the budget itself. Um, so there's no additional funding beyond what's in the appropriation. Um, that said, uh, we are seeking, as Ms. Fritz mentioned, um, a state uh, grant that's about over $600,000 uh, that would help us potentially expand some of those uh, career pathways opportunities, whether those are things that are on-site or off-site with different partners. We're also exploring partnerships with uh, local higher education organizations such as Consigamon Community College um, and uh, looking to start a more robust uh, job internship and, and capstone kind of projects. Uh, these, these innovation pathways eventually mean that you take some coursework usually your first couple of years and then as you get to be an upperclassman, um, there's more and more uh, opportunities for uh, experiences in the workplace itself. Um, so we're doing, I think, a lot of very uh, strong work to try to develop that because we know that certainly there's some urgency for the students who are current ninth graders and students coming up behind them. Um, at the same time, as I think Ms. Fritz mentioned, we believe these kinds of opportunities for career technical education are going to benefit lots and lots of students beyond those who may have considered ASABET, may have been interested in ASABET, um, and making students aware generally of careers that may help them make decisions about um, the vast majority of our students go to go beyond uh, uh, high school to uh, usually about 85% or so go to a four-year school, about another 10 to 15% will go to uh, a, a community college, often quinsigament. Um, there's statistics about that in your packet. Um, and we believe that uh, students who may not be going directly to work, uh, just as many of the students who attend ASABET who went to Shrewsbury go on to two and four-year colleges, uh, that it may help shape their decision making uh, with regard to what potential higher education they might pursue or pursue something directly to the workplace. We're looking at all those different options. Um, so it, it's a very important topic. There's been a lot of time and effort invested in it. Um, I think we're being thoughtful about the approach we're taking because we want to make sure it's benefiting not only the students who would have been looking at a vocational technical education, but other students beyond that as well. One follow-up. Quick follow-up on that innovation pathways. It seems to be the, uh, the application process is a lengthy one, a two-phase, uh, very long process. So where we stand currently on that application process itself? 
Sure. The application, uh, I believe, is due this June, um, and Dr. Lazad and uh, Mr. Bazillo from the high school and uh, the team there are working hard at that right now to get something uh, that will certainly be submitted at that date. Um, one of the reasons that there's funding in this budget, that $100,000 that's set aside, for example, um, is to be able to start to advance this work regardless of whether or not we receive that uh, grant. That would help accelerate that work for sure and be dollars that we may be eligible for from the state, so we thought it was prudent to explore that. Um, but this work going forward is not dependent on that to happen. It would be certainly um, a, a great opportunity if we're able to receive those funds, uh, but it's one of sort of many path, pathways, uh, so to speak, that we're following to try to provide that kind of opportunity for our students. Thank you. Further comments or questions on the school department budget? Ms. Hollenbeck. Lisa, Precinct 9. Um, I want to thank the school district for um, going through all these um, extra steps and research, and it's definitely been a huge journey and that one that you've accomplished very quickly. Um, I have one child who graduated from Shrewsbury High, fabulous. I have one that's graduating this June from Assabet, also doing fabulous. Um, and over the years, what I, I've been reading in industry is that business manufacturers and other industries require not only hands-on skills from their employees, but also these technical ones, um, you know, involving STEM that you're talking about. But one of my, my concerns is that a lot of the programs that you are maybe just starting off with are what we would consider white collar jobs. You know, the biotech, the you know, engineering, that kind of thing. The one, the things that Asabet and then Blackstone are able to do are these, you know, jobs that are crucial, you know, to our everyday life. Whether it be an auto mechanic, which actually needs to be, you know, computer literate these days, um, anyone touching any of our electronics or anything in our homes, our heating systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, it, you guys are doing a great job, and it's like kind of a band-aid. But I guess my question is really for State Rep. Hannah Kane. Um, is that, is there any movement in the state to really start addressing these issues? Um, opening a new Votex school, um, particularly because we're not the only district in the state that is going through this, that it really is a big picture thing. So I do want to thank Shrewsbury High for really moving really fast on this. Um, but really, it's a, it's a bigger picture issue. And, you know, we're just doing a Band-Aid, you know, with the gaps of, you know, what you can do. And I want to thank you for that. Is your question to the rep? Yeah. Rep? There you go, man. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Very good. And uh, thank you, Missy, for the question. Um, there is a very high uh, level of awareness about the challenges in vocational education right now and the lack of access to it. Um, it's something Senator Moore and I have both been very involved in um, and pushing for. Uh, so I would say a number of things around it. Um, one, I give a ton of credit to what the Shrewsbury leadership is doing here. They, they're really doing a fantastic job at exploring every single avenue. We've had multiple meetings, Senator Moore and I, with the schools um, on these issues, sort of working at all different levels. So I applaud the school department and the leadership for what you're doing. Um, Secondly, there is a workforce skills cabinet, which is including economic development, uh, labor and workforce, and education. It began under the Baker Polito administration. It's continuing under the Healy Driscoll administration. And one of the things that we've already talked to the administration a lot about is the fact that there's a lack of access to vocational education and that it's not the same vocational education that it was um, growing up, certainly when I was in school. Um, we have a huge need for people in the trades, um, and that has to be hands-on training. That is not just a book learning, and so that's very much understood. We have a challenge because of the way in which you fund vocational schools, new ones. It takes districts to come together to decide to do that. It's a huge hurdle, and it's not something um, that really has any state support, and so there's been a group of us who have also been pushing to um, have something similar to the MSBA, but really just focus on vocational schools and thinking about access to that. Um, 
I, I would say, um, in addition, um, the uh, workforce issues that we have here in the Commonwealth are also simultaneously pushing a lot of conversations around how do we make sure that we have a continuous flow of workforce that's coming in. Um, and there are a lot of areas right now where we just, when you project into the future, um, losing 110,000 people um, in a quick span of time means you're already lacking folks. And when you look at the fact that you don't have enough spots in training coming up through, through the schools, it gets even worse. So there's no easy answer. There's been more money that goes into the state budget every year to help um, think through different ways to provide access. Um, but none of it is a silver bullet that's going to all at once change it. But um, I guess the takeaway is it's a high priority um, at the state level and we'll continue. Senator Moore and I will certainly continue uh, to press on it as well and, and happy certainly to talk with anyone at any time about this issue offline. Thanks. Further comments or questions with reference to the school department budget, Ms. Delgado. Deb Delgado, Precinct 8. I also want to thank everybody in the school committee and the schools for what they do every day with our students. I have a small question. Um, the 48% increase in uh, substitutes, is that because we need more or because we're paying them a little bit more per day? Certainly, go right ahead, Sandy. It's, it's a combination of both. It, it, we all know in the job market it's difficult to find and with some of the fallout from coronavirus and just regular sickness, it was harder to find substitutes. And you know, looking at what you pay substitutes, so we did have a slight increase. Pat, was that last year? Yeah, before. So we, we have had an increase in our substitute pay, but it is definitely an area that was uh, difficult to fill and that in, in caused the additional increase. And during the budget process, we did, as a school committee, have a question on that line item and had excellent data given to us from Mr. Collins to make us feel comfortable that that was an appropriate area to add the funding for. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments or questions with reference to the school department budget? Ms. Goldman. Roberta Goldman, Precinct Date, and I, I think it's just a wonderful report that the committee, it was very articulate to all of us, uh, made you know, the different uh, innuendos of what was happening really happen. So I have a, a question, and it's about MCAS uh, requiring a certain amount of passage of um, tests before they uh, graduate from high school, and of course it, it has, um, I mean, you know, the issues are, you know, it, it had definitely has ramifications on teaching our children, mm -hmm. not only the special children with special needs, but the very bright children that we certainly have that come to school every day. So I was wondering if um, that has been in the discussion of um, doing, not doing away, but altering the kinds of graduation requirements of testing and in place put something that may be more stimulating for all of our children as, as you've done for the vocational mm -hmm. and early childhood. Thank you. And, and I know I've seen that in the media. That is a question. Families are questioning that. And it is also a benchmark that we use to make sure we know how we're doing. I would ask Dr. Sawyer if you know more about it at the state level, any changes. Dr. Sawyer. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Ms. Goldman. Uh, the State uh, Board of Education uh, earlier this year made a decision to, uh, in a future year, and it's a couple years out, I believe, uh, raise the uh, cutoff score for students uh, who qualify for graduation. It's been a reality now for going on a close to a quarter century that passing the MCAS has been a requirement to receive a diploma in any Massachusetts public high school. Uh, that uh, means both passing the uh, English Language Arts MCAS, the Mathematics MCAS, um, and the science and engineering MCAS. Um, that is something in terms of the uh, increase in expectations, I don't expect it to have a really significant effect on what we do uh, at Shrewsbury High School. We've been certainly fortunate that our, 
our passing rates are extremely high. Uh, we really don't run into too many issues with the student not being eligible for a diploma. Um, and fortunately, the state also provides multiple opportunities, just like other tests in society, like the bar exam or whatever it might be. If someone doesn't pass the first time, uh, they can get another opportunity. The vast majority of our students do pass the first time and usually pass with flying colors. Uh, I think the, the larger question is, you know, what's the proper role of a high-stakes test uh, in a public education environment? And there's a variety of opinions on that, of course, uh, and different people will have different philosophies. Um, I think that, uh, in my experience, uh, when I have the chance to visit classrooms, when we, I speak with instructional leaders in the district, uh, it is pretty rare that we're talking about uh, you know, the, the, the nomenclature of teaching to the test. Um, that's something I think people are concerned about, that somehow we're not uh, providing a, a rigorous or enriching curriculum because we're very focused on a particular exam. Uh, I think the good news is that in Massachusetts has done much better than a lot of states around the nation in that the uh, instructional frameworks, the curriculum frameworks that we're expected to teach students um, that's connected to the state test um, are, do have uh, high expectations for students and, and are, are, are well uh, developed, uh, usually and they're developed with educators in the field as they're adapted over time. Um, and that's something that I think uh, you're much more likely to see uh, if you visit one of our classrooms is teachers teaching to uh, a curriculum standard, uh, but doing that in a way that's instructionally uh, uh, certainly best practice, uh, but also uh, engaging for students. Um, I know that uh, it, it is, we, we are not doing a lot of sort of test prep. I don't walk into classrooms and see kids filling in a lot of bubble sheets um, and doing a lot of practice tests. We certainly prepare kids in a way. We don't want them to be surprised by what they uh, have. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes we're kind of surprised the amount of stress that kids, even young kids have about taking this test. Um, and sometimes that seems that that stress comes from just the environment, that it's, it's in the news, it's in the media, families talk about it, and we talk about it as, as a school district, but typically in ways to try to reassure students that um, it's less about them and it's more about how it's a, it's a good measure for us to gauge, are we teaching things effectively, are there curriculum adjustments we need to make. Um, but there is the reality that for high school students it is a high stakes test. Uh, I don't think the state change is going to make a big effect on us. Uh, I think going forward, as, as Fritz mentioned it uh, during her remarks, um, you know, we certainly have seen some effect, uh, negative effect, as a result of the pandemic. There's no question about it. Um, we've been impacted less than a lot of other districts, uh, thanks to the strength of our educators and the support of our families, um, and frankly, the financial support we've received from this body and from the community through the recent override. Uh, we're positioned very well to continue to move forward and recover from the pandemic and continue to make sure our students are getting lots of terrific opportunities. Um, so uh, it's something that we pay attention to. We think it's an important measure in a variety of ways, but it's not something that we focus on uh, in a way that uh, I think is deleterious to our work. But thank you for the question. Further comments or questions with reference to Ms. Vetter? Judy Vetter, Precinct 9. Um, a question um, for the school, but also for the municipal uh, budget. I was wondering, uh, as far as pandemic monies that um, have not been spent, and as we're hearing in the news, if the federal government does decide to claw back that money, uh, what type of impact will that have on the school budget and also on the municipal budget? Mr. Sawyer? Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins. Yeah. So I could uh, speak to, with uh, respect to the COVID monies that the school district has received uh, during the pandemic, and it's referenced in your uh, budget book that we mailed to you on pages uh, 29 and 30. Uh, there's some specific pieces there. Uh, but primarily, you know, we did receive both uh, uh, state funding grants um, that provided uh, much needed support, but also uh, much more kind of well-known, uh, the so-called ESSER, um, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds, uh, in three different uh, allocations. And they were referred to in the media as ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. And uh, those amounts are uh, specified in your uh, booklet on those pages that I referenced. Uh, and I would tell you that, um, for example, on page 29, uh, in the middle there where it says Care Act, CARES Act ESSER, uh, that the ESSER 1 funds, $162,000, is fully spent. So that first part was fully spent very quickly. 
Um, the so-called ESSER II funding, uh, $557,280. Uh, those monies need to be expended by this September. We'll, be have, we'll have those funds fully expended by the end of this summertime. Uh, and then ESSER III uh, will go out to um, uh, next September 30th of uh, 2024. And uh, by that time, all of those funds will be expended as well. We still have some remaining funds in ESSER III, uh, and those remaining funds will be used uh, for primarily uh, late bus service uh, that we're providing to students so they can participate in extracurricular activities uh, since we want to get kids back involved in a social network, uh, if you will. It also has provided and will continue to provide uh, summer school uh, support for those students uh, that need some extra uh, support as well uh, and also uh, some counseling services. So uh, I have no uh, doubt that uh, with respect to the COVID funds uh, and specifically the deadlines uh, associated with the federal, the use of the federal funds that all of the Shrewsbury schools will uh, uh, put the, all of the, have put all of those funds to good use by the deadlines. And I know Dr. Sawyer just wanted to make a follow-up comment. Dr. Sawyer. Thank you. And, and just to the question about the federal government calling them back, I would just make a brief editorial comment. Uh, it is, it, it was essentially stated by pretty much everyone that this was going to be a multi-year recovery from this pandemic. Um, and when these grant funds were uh, allocated, um, it was clear that there were certain deadlines and we could make use of them for a certain amount of time. Uh, and I think the idea that somehow we should have hurried up and spent them all, all in one big fell swoop right at the beginning, even if we could have, uh, is somewhat of a disingenuous argument to say that now we're sitting on them and somehow we're not using them well and therefore we should lose them. Um, so essentially we were told, make a plan to use these over the next two to three years. We made that plan. We think it's a responsible plan. And now there's certain politicians in Washington, D.C. saying, well, that plan isn't any good. You should have spent the money already and we want it back. Um, so when you see that in the media or the news, I, I would ask that you consider that. Uh, it's a little bit of a bait and switch uh, from my perspective at the local level. Mr. Mizakar. Hold on. I don't think people can hear you. The, the ongoing operating budget uh, has very limited uh, influence through the uh, ARPA funds. Uh, we are uh, slowly, um, or we're using a small amount, less than uh, one half of 1% uh, to seed four position, five positions within the budget, including four firefighters. Uh, beyond that, we have allocated all those funds, and uh, with the allocation of those funds, as the way the federal regs are written, we are not at risk for clawback. Uh, the select board has set a spending plan to have them all expended within the time horizons provided to us through those regulations. Further comments or questions with reference to the school department budget? Ms. Ayer? No, no, it's coming. Okay. Um, I'm Sanam Zayar, uh, District 7. Um, my question is page 34, items A2, A3. Um, I was wondering, as many of us know, the teaching and paraprofessional, the landscape of what it's like in the classroom is significantly different post-pandemic. And I was wondering if these um, percentage changes take into account negotiations with the teacher and professional union or if those happen later. And I guess attached to that question is, if our teachers and paraprofessionals are happy with the salary increases and benefits that they're receiving in the district. Ms. Fritz. The information. Go ahead. The information in the uh, budget takes in consideration all of the union contracts. Our, ours are all settled for this year. And as far as I know, everybody is very happy with that, what they've received. And, it's not easy to do union negotiations. Um, our purpose as a school committee, we always want to make sure that we are paying our people fairly and at a, a market rate, and we put the money into their pockets. So there is a lot of discussion when we do union negotiations. But it's, it's something that we feel we've done well with, and we have a very good um, relationship with our union leadership as well. So everything in the budget is already done in our contracts. 
further comments or questions with reference to the school department budget, Ms. McManus? Right down front. Nope, I guess she's coming this way, okay. Hi, Sandy McManus, Precinct 10. Um, I've learned quite a lot tonight. My kids have been out of school for quite a while from here. But should we as a community uh, be thinking about in the future and with some of our other neighboring communities about a vocational school coming? And I don't know the answer to that, but I, that's what I'm thinking. It's Mr. Sawyer seems to be making his way toward the... Sandy? I think that's a question that a lot of people have on their minds. And I know last year, in order to build a vocational technical school, it's about $350 million. It's a very large school with a lot of equipment. Um, I don't, I haven't heard anything about anybody getting together to do something like that. Is that something we could do maybe down the road, possibly? But that is another long-term solution. So I think what we're looking for right now, we cannot replicate, but we can mitigate. That's what we keep saying. We're doing our best to make sure that we're giving those experiences. But I think it's a state-level problem because it's so expensive to build those schools, and we know the MSBA funding is limited. It's got to come really from the state down how we're going to handle this problem going forward. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 8, the school department budget. Am I seeing someone? Yeah. Right, she's right there. Ah, seven hands. Yes, right on the aisle. Thank you. Hi, Carissa Ford, District 3, uh, Precinct 3. I was curious about um, line items D1 and D2. Um, D1, I'm just curious what advertising means in the notes description. Um, and then D2 is for educational contracted services. And there's quite a list there of all the different mm -hmm. services. And so I'm wondering if you could shed some light on what percentage goes toward athletic facility rentals versus mindfulness. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins. Sure, so uh, with respect to uh, specifically advertising, uh, that is um, for advertising and recruitment of staff. Uh, of course, we're in a, a difficult labor market like everyone else, um, and so we've had to increase our expenses and uh, try new venues and new uh, formats for recruiting staff, so we have some increases there. Uh, D2, um, uh, in terms of the allocations for some of those uh, additional services that uh, Mrs. Fritz uh, mentioned at the beginning. Uh, for example, uh, we've budgeted for the equity audit under that D2 category, uh, $55,000, that's new money for fiscal 24. Uh, we've budgeted $25,000 for uh, consultant services or, co excuse me, contract services uh, to assist with the uh, attendance and residency uh, verifications. We've budgeted $77,000 for uh, an external uh, third-party security and safety audit. Uh, that was based upon a little bit of test marketing around what those services might cost. Um, we've budgeted $38,500 for some follow-on strategic plan consultant services. Again, as was referenced at the beginning, uh, the strategic plan uh, has been uh, really kind of formalized, uh, and so what we think is going to be successful is to have kind of a phase two and make sure that uh, the implementation part and the follow-up part is uh, well executed. And then finally, again, uh, a reference earlier, uh, also in that category, is the $100,000 for uh, some form of vocational uh, support. We're not really exactly sure what all those things might be right now, uh, but um, we put it into that D2 category, the $100,000. So hopefully that explains uh, the lion's share of those uh, increases for that D2 category. You mentioned athletic facility rentals, so can I just understand what you're saying? Oh, yes, thank you, Dr. Sorry. So uh, facility rentals uh, uh, means for athletics is the, uh, we, of course, like any other school district, need to rent uh, ice time um, for our boys and girls hockey team. Um, swimming pools uh, for the swimming team. Um, 
and then uh, also uh, for our golf team, uh, greens fees for those competitions as well. So those would be examples of uh, quote unquote facility rentals. Follow up. Um, I would just like to make, oh, sure, <laughs> Carissa Ford, precinct. Uh, just a comment that as we look at equity audits and the um, infusing the school with the DEI initiatives, I think it would be wise to separate out the athletic fees from things like equity audits um, and translations, mindfulness, um, if we look at who is participating in golf and hockey and swimming, I think it might be a different group than is benefiting from things like translations. So I think we should reflect that in our budget. Thank you. Further comments or questions with reference to the school department budget? Just a second, John. Anybody else? Mr. Sigilnik. John Sigilnik, uh, Precinct 2. Um, on page 34, items C1 and C2, um, these two budget items have been reduced by about $1.2 million. So I guess my, my question really is, seeing you know the total on the school budget probably would not change. If, if these items were flat from last year, what would not be in this year's budget that you did include to take the place of this $1.2 million. Did not include? Is that what you said? No. Was that would, you would you not be able to include? If this, if this $1.2 million was not reduced, you'd have to take that money from someplace else. Absolutely. And I think when you look at the budget every year, I mean, part of the, um, we had some tuition savings from Vogue, but we also had increase in cost of living in prices, so it, it's not always a equal transition from one to the other, but I agree. It, it depends on what the needs and priorities are every year and what we're looking for. But you're not sure what specific items would have we not would, We not would have in included in, I'm having a hard time hearing you, John. Well, the budget's the budget. You, you wouldn't be able to have added $1.2 million to the budget number you have. Right. If those two items were not reduced. So somewhere you'd have to take mm -hmm. that $1.2 million out of other line items. Exactly. And I'm curious, where would you have done that? Yeah, exactly. We, we, never, it's, we never talked about it. It's, it's like a, during a deposition, if somebody asks you something speculative, you just like, can't answer that. So I think it's one of those where we would have to go through and look we had a lot of conversations when we looked at adding to the budget what we needed, and it was based on the strategic plan and goals going forward, priorities, and learning gaps. So that's where we backed into our budget using the funding that we had. Further comments or questions? Yes, Ms. Hilton. Bridget Hilton, Precinct 7. Uh, Mr. Collins, I don't know if I misheard you, but did you mention something about an attendance survey or something like that? Attendance, enrollment, something? Mr. Could Collins. you explain what that is? Sure. So we've uh, allocated, uh, the school committee has allocated $25,000 towards uh, some contract services to help uh, with uh, student attendance, tracking down students, and also residency verifications. Uh, the, you know, we go through a process when, during new student registration um, to verify uh, students and families' residence in, in Shrewsbury and certainly in the, the world in which we're living. Uh, it's become uh, more difficult with different family arrangements and uh, certainly more time consuming and more complicated. So that's what those services would be for, to assist us with that work. Follow up. So for the second part, for the residency verification, is, the, is my understanding that there is some unknown number of students in Shrewsbury that we suspect 
don't live in a tax-paying home in Shrewsbury, is that it? And how big of a concern is this? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you. Um, the issue of students, whether their, their residency status is probably, uh, other than having to deal with issues around considering student safety or, or issues that affect students' health and well-being, uh, probably the least favorite part of my job. Um, obviously, when we have students come through our doors, we educate every single one of them to the best of our ability, uh, regardless of who they are. Um, and the message we've been sending uh, consistently is that we want every one of our students to feel unconditionally accepted for who they are. Uh, we are also required to make sure uh, that uh, under Massachusetts state law, uh, that students who attend Shrewsbury Public Schools are residents of Shrewsbury. Um, and there can be a variety of very complicated situations. Sometimes that happens when um, students uh, experience a uh, divorce or separation with their parents and uh, one parent may leave the community. Uh, sometimes there are situations where the student is living with that parent uh, outside of town. Uh, however, there may be uh, circumstances that allow us to continue to uh, educate that student within the school district. Uh, there's also a reality, and this has been a reality as long as I've been in Shrewsbury since 1997, uh, that some families uh, who want to have their children educated in the Shrewsbury Public Schools um, do not tell us the truth about their residency status um, and give us an address uh, and give us uh, documentation that sometimes is false um, and enroll their students with us. Uh, and when that happens, typically, uh, unfortunately for the student, uh, we find that out at some point and we have to have a difficult conversation with that parent. Um, we certainly don't want to have that student leave our schools. We would never prefer that. Our teachers don't want to stop teaching that young person. Uh, but uh, I often have to make the unpleasant decision uh, to say that we're no longer able to educate their child in our schools because they're not a resident um, and they need to return to the community where they're from. Sometimes that's a neighboring community. Uh, oftentimes it's the city of Worcester. Uh, sometimes it's a place where the family has moved and did not tell us because they wanted their child to continue. Uh, there is a school committee policy um, that allows a student who moves um, after they complete their junior year of high school, that if they're in good standing and they move during their senior year, that uh, if the, with the recommendation of the high school administration, uh, that the school committee can vote um, to allow that student to remain and finish their senior year. That's been a long-standing policy. Uh, part of that policy is also that if a student experiences a very significant hardship in their life, um, the two that are mentioned are the death of a parent uh, and uh, the potential uh, terminal disease of the student themselves. And those are just a couple of examples that we've had in the past where we've allowed a student with school committee vote uh, to continue, no matter the age of the student. Uh, sometimes an elementary age student is allowed uh, by vote of the school committee to continue their education because of their circumstances. Um, those situations I can count on one hand. Um, unfortunately, there are dozens of times over the years where I've had to tell families where we've discovered that they don't live in town uh, that they can no longer attend school here. We usually try to give them a bit of time um, so that there can be a positive transition for, for the young person. Um, but the, the unfortunate reality is that um, as much as our hearts would like us to continue to educate that student um, under the law, uh, we really can't. And obviously there are Shrewsbury resources that are going to supporting that. And we have a situation, of course, where uh, we don't have sufficient space, particularly in our high school. Um, and uh, I think what Mr. Collins reference is that you know, we, we are continuing, that we're starting to see um, some more and more complex cases where um, you know, there's different family arrangements, different situations where who a guardian might be. Um, the state has uh, some documents and some court decisions that can guide us around those kinds of things. So uh, the bottom line is if there's a student uh, who uh, we can, can make the case uh, that they are eligible to be educated in our students, uh, we want to continue to be able to do that. But if the, the situation is that they're not legally able to be educated, uh, that's something that we need to make hard decisions about. Um, and uh, frankly, the registrar position in our central office is often the role that is dealing with that uh, in terms of documentation, in terms of making phone calls, in terms of communicating with families. Um, and that has become so complicated in some cases that we feel having some third party uh, support for that will enable us to do that job better. So that's essentially the, the landscape that we're talking about. Um, and we, we have some funding to be able to be able to uh, try to make sure that we're being fair uh, and that we have all the information we need to make a fair decision. Further comments or questions with reference to the school department 
budget. I think I'm seeing a gentleman on the aisle. Yes, sir. Uh, has the, with the Please identify yourself with your precinct. Uh, Rajiv Papu, Precinct 4. Regarding the uh, surcharge of $1 million or greater that passed recently, has any of that, some of that money supposed to be used for public education? Has any of that been budgeted, or have we received anything? You're talking at the at the uh, state, state level, level, right? Yeah. I have heard nothing, um, to, you know, coming down to us. I don't know if Pat or anybody, or even Representative Kane, may have to call on her again. You may approach. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the money from the millionaire's tax or the fair share amendment, depending on your perspective, um, is being allocated for the first time in this fiscal uh, year coming up. So uh, the governor included it in her um, budget that she initially filed. The House, we just did our budget um, in April, and we included um, funding um, and allocated it. And the Senate will do the same, and then it will get conferenced. Um, right now, the split uh, is about 50-50 between education and transportation related. Um, one of the most direct ways um, it's envisioned spending um, is something you might all be familiar with, universal school meals during the, the pandemic. Uh, the meals were uh, provided and paid for um, by the federal government. Um, that has now ceased, but Massachusetts is one of five states which is seeking to continue that. Um, and uh, part of the money coming from the, um, the fair share amendment may be used towards <laughs> that, um, which has a direct implication on the town budget because uh, they're able to uh, envision that uh, the school meal department being funded uh, by that money that would be coming down from the state rather than having to do it through payments coming through students um, paying for it. I know it's always been self-sustaining, um, but there's a lot better ability to project that um, and the good news is kids are eating more and learning better um, because of it but it's about a 50 50 split between education and transportation um, and we'll know after we conference the budget exactly how that uh, is going to break out into different line items that impact both of those um, areas further comments or questions with reference to the school department budget yes sir Raju Pallavati, mm -hmm. Precinct 4. Thank you, thank you all very much for coming here today and answering all our questions diligently. Uh, the question I have is regarding uh, transportation. I know several of the uh, communities across the nation are using the Build Back Better programs, the grants from that program to, uh, I, mean, travel, I mean, transport towards better transportation like sustainable transportation. So are we doing anything in that respect? I'm gonna let Mr. Collins answer that. <laughs> Mr. Collins. Sure, there's a, uh, uh, there were monies uh, allocated uh, by the federal government to incentivize uh, the purchase of uh, electric buses. Uh, the school district made an attempt to apply for those funds the first round and was unsuccessful. Um, most communities uh, 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 that received funding to procure electric vehicles uh, were in a so-called prioritized category, um, and those prioritized categories uh, typically were ones with uh, lower or more difficult <coughs> socioeconomics and uh, would not necessarily have the funds uh, to uh, go in that direction. Uh, so I don't think uh, and while that, that, that program will continue uh, for multiple years to incentivize uh, the uh, procurement and use of electric vehicles, I don't think that uh, communities like Shrewsbury uh, are going to be very successful unless it's kind of near the end of that and the prioritized communities are funded first. But uh, we did make an attempt and we're not successful. Further comments or questions with reference to the school department budget? Not hearing or seeing any, 
We will now move to the next page, page 36, for operating support. Questions on operating support, page 36 of the budget. Not hearing or seeing any, we have waded our way through this budget. If there aren't any open questions, we will now call the vote. A simple majority is required. All those in favor of Article 8 shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We will now move to our first bundle of the evening. When you folks pulled in tonight, you got a, a three uh, substitute motions as well as a schedule of the uh, bond, uh, bundled items. So I will now call for bundle nine covering articles nine, 10, and 11. I move the printed motions for bundle nine, including articles nine, 10, and 11. Second. Finance committee. Finance committee recommends passage of articles nine, 10, and 11 unanimously. Mr. Mizakar. Uh, this bundle represents traditional incoming revenue from the municipal light department through two articles and for the use of free cash, all lowering the tax rate impact. Our practice has been that we run through the items that have been bundled. Obviously, if there are any questions on them, we stop and we answer them. Article 9. Article 10. Article 11. Not seeing any, we will take the vote now on Bundle 9, covering Articles 9, 10, and 11. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We will now move to Bundle 10, covering Articles 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. I move the printed motion under, for Bundle 10, including Articles 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Finance Committee. Nope. Just a second. Second. What? Second. Oh, well, move along. <laughs> Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage, uh, recommends passage of all articles in, in Bundle 10 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizakar. These articles represent the operating budgets for fiscal year 24 for our utility operations and for PEG access, which is uh, Shrewsbury Media Connections operation of public access programming. Articles 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 could all be considered individual departments, just like you approved within the operating budget. They provide salary, wages, and expenses for our utility operations. The difference is the revenues come in from the rates associated with each one of those programs. And in the case of PEG Access, it comes from a 5% cable franchise agreement with, Shrews or with Selco. Comments or questions on Article 12? 13. Oh, Article 12, Ms. Hollenbeck. Lisa Hollenbeck, Precinct 9. Um, in regard to the water, um, I know the state is doing a lot of um, improvements regarding PFAS. Um, do any of these budgets include that, or is that something we'll just have to wait for next year? Mr. Mizakar. We have funding associated that with, in a later article, within the capital improvements for the water department. And we are doing ongoing testing within the operating budget for, for water. That's, that's what's included in these articles. Article 12, 13, 14, 15, Ms. Nichols. Dina Nichols, Precinct 7. I'm trying to keep up with you on the bundle, I have to admit. Um, <laughs> but on article getting back to the water, um, this is not a specific question, it's a general question. There's, I know there's some, um, something, some stuff coming up down the pike regarding water, and the, we're gonna have a major uh, project coming up. 
And does this at all tie into any of that at any point? Um, can you talk about the relationship between, um, maybe I'm jumping ahead on that, but what's to come um, that we've been hearing about the need for a new uh, system or plant or whatever, and um, what's happening here in Article 13? Mr. Mizuka? Sure, so um, those larger uh, investments uh, coming down the line are in Article 13, or excuse me, 30. Um, and uh, Article 14 provides for the ongoing operations of the existing water system, including our existing water treatment plant, uh, mains, pump stations, things like that. So um, they are really are two separate and distinct things. One. Uh, again, ongoing operations, and one or the other is one-time capital investments. Um, they certainly relate to each other because the uh, funding that we use through the operating budget is proportional to the type of plant and the way we operate our system. Um, I don't know if um, Mr. Howland or Mr. Rowley are able to provide any additional correlation between the two articles. But I, I would encourage you to think of them, you know, separately um, at this point, and we'll get into a lot more discussion in Article 30. Further, there anything else? yes. <clears throat> Dating gone at precinct two. Can we just go back to 13 for one sure. minute? Sure, absolutely. Um, can. With the contract with waste management and, oh my God, I can't think of the other. Um, Casella. Casella, thank you. Um, when the contract is up, how is that gonna work and how's it working currently um, with them picking up the yard waste? How is that working with these numbers? Um, I know a lot of the public is very concerned that we're spending more money now. I know it's somewhat of a savings. So can you just run that through for the public and just explain these numbers a little bit? And um, I know just so that people have a little bit of an idea how these numbers are working in the, in the budget, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, our contracted waste services are, uh, we're in Article 12, contracted waste services are under contractual services uh, line four. Um, so is recommended for fiscal year 24, uh, roughly $2.7 million. This includes our collections at the curb, our disposal um, at the incinerator. Uh, when it comes to yard waste, it includes collections at the curb. Uh, collections uh, centrally at um, South Street and then disposal uh, for hauling it up to uh, the landfill. So we have two uh, independent contracts. Casella is now providing services to the town for uh, yard waste collections. Um, so that was stripped from waste management due to their poor performance. Um, the current agreement that we have with waste management uh, includes, runs through the end of this upcoming fiscal year. So this current fiscal year will be going back out and uh, to the market and uh, getting bids and selecting uh, a new contractor potentially uh, or looking at uh, current services provided by waste management. Uh, that's completely independent from our agreement with Casella, which we have multiple years of options. So this is the first year and we have uh, two additional option years that we could explore. So any funds that were originally associated with uh, curbside waste collection that would have been paid to waste management are not going to be paid to them. And they were redirected to uh, Casella. Uh, many of you participated in our mailed survey to residents seeking input on how we can improve uh, yard waste collections. Um, and we heard loud and clear that you would like to see more yard waste collections. So we are able to budget for that within this budget, within the means of uh, the program. So there is an increased cost, but it is fully offset by what, of, what would have went to waste management, um, plus what we've budgeted for, for the enhanced service weeks. So um, we've, we've tried to improve those programs, apologize for the challenges that we had for last fiscal year. We have three, uh, weeks of yard waste collections under our belt uh, for the spring with Casella and they've uh, performed very well. 
Um, so we hope that continues throughout the course of the year and we can continue to provide these enhanced services through these different contracts. Now there is a possibility that Casella may win uh, the curbside um, solid waste collections uh, when we go out to bid, but that will be determined by a uh, Chapter 30B procurement process that we'll undertake. We're on Article 12. For the questions on 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, if there are none, I'll call the vote on bundle 10 that covers articles 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Bundle 11, items 17, 18, articles 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. I move the printed motions for bundle 11, including articles 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of all articles in bundle 11 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mezikar. So this represents the largest bundle, obviously, this evening, and this group of articles is uh, very traditional in our annual town meeting warrant, and where we're taking on various projects, normally of uh, lower uh, expenditure amounts, relatively speaking, and I'll run through those really briefly. Article 17, we pay out-of-pocket medical expenses for individuals who are disabled in our employment as police officers and firefighters in accordance with the general laws. In Article 18, we're looking to place $20,000 into our insurance trust fund, which we use to pay deductibles and out-of-pocket expenses with regards to our uh, general liability, workers' compensation, injured on duty pol uh, insurance policies. We have a target policy level of $125,000 to be in that account, and currently we have 68. Article 19, we're moving money into the town's rainy day fund, $675,000 being deposited from free cash, uh, bringing the projected total to uh, just shy of $5.8 million. Article 20, we're placing money into a special uh, reserve fund, special revenue, excuse me, special purpose stabilization fund of the sewer department. So this is uh, a rainy day fund of the sewer department. It can only be used for those purposes after appropriation by town meeting. So you would control how that's expended in the future. Article 21 uh, is a similar transaction for the water department, $479,000. Article 22 is setting the annual amount that we're allowed to expend through two particular revolving accounts, which are established in our general bylaws. Revolving funds separately account for specific revenues and holds them for expenditures for, to support the activity for which those funds were raised, uh, transportation, and the Donahue Rowing Center. We're setting those maximum amounts that we could expend. Article 23 is receiving money uh, from the Commonwealth for the improvement of roadways. We anticipate a little less than a million dollars this year, uh, collectively or, or colloquially known as uh, Chapter 90. Uh, Article 24 is transferring $18,000 from the sale of cemetery lots to the perpetual uh, care and improvement and enlargement of the cemetery, and we've provided account balances and trust fund balances there in the details. Article 25 is moving $35,000 in free cash to manage um, lakes, ponds, and waterways within the community. Uh, the vast majority of these funds goes to the Lake Quinn Sigamon Commission to manage uh, various aspects of water quality there, including invasive species weed management. Uh, we also spread those funds to other bodies of waters and waterways within the community as needed. Article 26 is the annual appropriation to Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services to support counseling and education for Shrewsbury residents. Uh, $225,000 in free cash is being requested for those purposes. Comments or questions with reference to Bundle 11, Article 17? Ms. Hollenbeck. Melissa Hollenbeck, Precinct uh, 9. 
Um, for Article 24 regarding new cemeteries, would that be impacted depending on how we vote on a later article? Mr. Mizikar. Uh, no, uh, we would propose no changes to this. This is an article that we have here every year, and it's more about how we operate the, the uh, near-term and long-term care uh, for the lands associated with, uh, at this time, Mountain View Cemetery. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Oh, come right up, sir. Uh, Madhu Mishra, Precinct 4. This is in regards to Article 25. The, the, the $35,000 for the lakes and ponds uh, where Worcester is only paying 10000 We just wanted to rationalize the two numbers. Mr. Mizikar. Sure. So um, this is not just for Lake Quinsigamond. So um, we do other water quality improvement initiative, initiatives within town lakes and ponds. We've done some work recently in Old Mill Pond, Newton Pond, just to name a few. Um, Worcester and Shrewsbury, Worcester and Shrewsbury normally proportionally split the cost of weed management and then Grafton provides that single contribution. The city of Worcester had been terrible at this in the past and they really have stepped up recently and provided their fair share uh, for managing the water quality of the lake. Article 25, Article 26. I'm not seeing anyone. Regarding Bundle 11 and Articles 17 through 26, requiring majority vote, all those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? It carries. Thank you. We're on to Article 27. I move the printed motion under Article 27. Second. <laughs> Finance <it>. Committee. <laughs> Finance <laughs> Committee recommends passage of Article 27 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mezikar. Article 27 is the general capital improvement uh, plan for fiscal year 25, or excuse me, 24, uh, uh, for all non-utility departments. So you'll see listed there on page 47, of, 47 a variety of investments uh, across a number of departments. We're happy to answer any uh, questions associated uh, with those investments. Unfortunately, we weren't able to fund all requests from all departments due to funding limitations um, and trying to maintain an appropriate level of free cash, which we're using to, to fund the entire cost of this. Uh, spare $24,000 that we're transferring from a prior article. Uh, questions or comments with reference to Article 27? What am I seeing somebody? Yes, sir. Mr. Pitney. Patrick Pitney, Precinct 5. On the, um, under the engineering budget, buildings and facilities, it's a sidewalk and roadway improvements. Why is that not coming out of Chapter 90 funds? So, Mr. Vizica. In brief, it is to augment Chapter 90 funds. We only receive 987000 for Chapter 90. It has been an initiative for us to uh, be a little bit more aggressive with our sidewalk improvement plan. As you can see in the community, we need to do some work there. Uh, we've been replacing handicap ramps and making those types of improvements, and we hope to be able to build enough money to uh, do some general sidewalk uh, improvements. But Chapter 90 just isn't enough, especially with the cost of asphalt and things uh, as we see them now. Okay, thank you. Article 27, further comments or questions? Yes, sir, in the middle. Tom Moore, Precinct 10. On the item AEDs for cruisers for the police department for $35,900, were grants pursued for those items? Mr. Mizikar. 
Uh, not specifically for these AEDs, although I am happy to report through the state budget process, Representative Kane got an earmark for us for AEDs in the parks, so hopefully that's able to stay in there. Um, they weren't specifically uh, approved for this. This is an initiative that we wanted to move uh, forward with starting July 1, 2024. Uh, it's part of uh, a new initiative that we have that was bargained through the collective bargaining agreement with the department, so we didn't apply for any specific grants here. Follow up, sir? Were grants available for, for AEDs for cruisers? Mr. Not, Mizikar? Not specifically that I'm aware of. I don't know if Chief Anderson had. Not that I'm. The Chief reports not that he's aware of. Thank you. Certainly. Comments or questions with reference to Article 27? Anybody else before we go up in that corner again? Yeah, no, I know. I know. Thanks. Diener, I think you actually moved ahead of John Segilnik. I don't want to monopolize this microphone, but um, Dean and Nicholas, Precinct 7. I did have a question about the ARPA funds on um, that article with the capital expenses. Is I know that I saw the brochure that I think we had gotten tonight that talked about how they were being allocated, um, which was great. And it didn't look like, I thought it looked like that there, there was still a balance of um, 7,974 after from phase one. Is that accurate? Mr. Um, Mr. And if Hold so, on, let's we, go one at a time. Mr. Mizikar. Okay. So that was accurate after phase one, but phase two has been implemented and was improved in December and it allocated all but roughly 270,000 in ARPA funds. So okay, so the follow up. Are, sure, um, well, I guess it's more a comment than a follow up. Um, I would have hoped more would have been put towards capital expenses, but um, that's not for me to decide. That's more comment. Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Zagilnik. John Zagilnik, Precinct 2. Um, back to the sidewalks and roadway improvements in mostly Chapter 90. Um, basically, the way you answered the question, I'm making the assumption that we're spending more than the $300,000 on sidewalk improvements. And, and I guess my real question is, if I remember previous situations, when we were to spend Chapter 90 funds, I thought we had to approve them through an article in terms of what we were spending them on, as opposed to just arbitrarily spending them. Is that correct, or am I Mr. Mizikar? No, it's never been handled that way. Um, all municipalities receive Chapter 90 funds and uh, allow for their expenditure through the article as the motion uh, read. Um, we hope to be able to spend the $300,000 in any funds that um, remain in the roadway and sidewalk improvement program, which they're very limited because we have been expending them. My reference in my prior comment was just that 987000 to manage our 160 miles of roadways is not sufficient, so we're trying to put more funding in place to maintain uh, roadways and sidewalks, um, this little bit of funding through the capital improvement program. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 27, the capital plan? Not seeing or hearing any, this is requiring a majority vote. All those in favor of Article 27 shall say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. 27 passes. Article 28. I move the printed motion under Article 28. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 28 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizikar. So there are two parts to this article. The first is the traditional cash funded capital improvement plan found in the chart at the bottom of page 48 in your town meeting book, totaling $2,964,709. The second aspect of the article is a borrowing authorization for $9,820,000, which would be repaid through revenues raised through the sewer rate. These funds would be used to make critical improvements in the Rolf and Maple Avenue pump stations and to replace the associated force main. Uh, the Rolf Avenue pump station and force main was constructed approximately 60 years ago, and the Maple Avenue pump station was constructed in the 1990s. These features of the sewer system flow approximately 50% of the total sewerage on a daily basis and therefore a significant failure would be catastrophic. 
town staff submitted an application that was improved that was approved for acceptance into the 2023 state revolving fund program this competitive process funds the most critical needs for water and sewer infrastructure in the commonwealth through low interest loans uh, currently two percent which is much better than the market so we're asking for your consideration and improvements uh, asking for your consideration for these improvements uh, for the 9.8 million dollars in a borrowing authorization and slightly less than three million dollars in cash funded initiatives we're happy to answer any questions associated with these improvements for the sewer system question and comments with reference to article 28 the capital improvement plans for sewer any comments or questions not seeing any this require hey, yes we've got one down front go right ahead Shannon Wild, Precinct 7, uh, looking to get a better understanding of what the potential rate increase would be for the sewage bills. Mr. Mizikar. Uh, Mr. Snowden may be able to best Mr. answer Mr. Snowden. Uh, are you looking for the rate as if with this being proposed or just the rate in general as we move forward? That would be proposed, yes. All right, great. Um, the $9.8 million um, would require about an uh, increase in revenue of about six and a quarter percent. Um, and the sewer commissioners two years ago adopted a financial plan where there was um, proposed rate increases year over year within the range of um, five percent. Follow up. Shannon Wild, Precinct 7. Just to be clear, the expected rate was five percent and we're looking for a, a 6.25. Yes. I, I apologize. Um, the financial plan included rate increases each year over a five-year period uh, for about an average of 5%. Um, this funding would require an increase in revenue of about 6.25%. Okay. Thank yep. you. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 28? Mr. Pitney. Patrick Pitney, Precinct 5. Could you just review the terms of the bond in terms of length and um, possible rates? And then also in terms of the rate increase, when the bond is paid off, would those rates come back down? Mr. Mizikar. So through the state revolving fund program, it's a guaranteed 2% interest rate, which again is uh, much better than the municipal bond market, which is hovering between 45 and 5% on issuances of this size, um, that would be a 20-year term. Um, unlike a debt exclusion, that at the end of this, uh, there would not be uh, a, a rate reduction, uh, but the sewer uh, commissioners, of course, you know, there wouldn't be a statutory rate reduction, but the sewer commissioners look at their rates each and every year and make those adjustments annually, and, um, 20 years from now probably would be an opportunity to take on another capital improvement project. Um, when we structure this debt, it's subject to the terms and agreements through the general state revolving fund. So normally that's a level payment versus a declining payment like we do on our other notes. So uh, that 6.2% um, or the, the net increase associated with the debt would remain for that entire 20 year period. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 28, the sewer plan, Mr. Zikos. Uh, Paul Zikos, Precinct 6, uh, precinct <laughs> for 42 years. I'm in Precinct 1 now. <laughs> so used to saying that. Um, with respect to this uh, article, it's kind of open-ended at the beginning uh, when it talks about uh, potential land acquisition costs or the need for easements. Um, Two-pronged question. One is, do we anticipate having to uh, acquire um, any land to uh, facilitate this for long-term planning for the town? Um, and if so, um, how will we know how that will be funded? Mr. Mizikar. Sure. So, so uh, the short answer is no, because we're replacing existing infrastructure that's already there at Rolf Avenue and Maple and, and within the roadways. Um, However, um, if it were required, it would have to come through these funds or through an, a future appropriation if, if they weren't available here. 
Further comments or questions with reference to Article 28? Not hearing and seeing any, this requiring a two-thirds vote. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, the ayes have it. Article 29. I move the printed motion under Article 29. Second. Finance Committee. The Finance Committee does not recommend passage of Article 29. What's that? We move to defeat this article. You might want to tell people that. Yeah, we move to defeat the printed motion under Article 29. Second. Second. The motion is to defeat Article 29, folks. We've heard from the board. We've heard from the Finance Committee. Mr. Mizuka, would you like to explain to those that uh, so, gathered? Uh, according to our rules, uh, we have to take action on each and every item, and there's no uh, capital improvements associated uh, with the stormwater budget this year. So defeating this article um, has no consequence, and we wouldn't be taking any action. So we'd, we'd request your defeat of it. Comments or questions with reference to this article? Okay, all those in favor shall signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? Oh. There you go. <laughs> article 30. I move the printed motion under Article 30. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 30 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizakar. Uh, so uh, this article, much like uh, the article under uh, sewer capital, has two uh, components to it. There's a smaller cash funded capital plan totaling $80,000 found on the center of page 51 in your town meeting book. Uh, the second part of this seeks a $12 million borrowing authorization to fund capital needs of the water system for the next three years. This is a fundamental change in how the town approaches capital investments within the water system. This change is proposed as a result of roughly two years of capital planning by uh, town leadership. This plan invests in critical infrastructure through deep rehabilitation or replacement to provide reliable and safe drinking water. During this process, prevailing costs were assessed and it was determined that transitioning to uh, a debt-funded approach would be more stable, affordable, and equitable in comparison to a cash-funded approach which has been used uh, historically, and I'll expand upon those. So I'll first talk about cost escalations and then about uh, rate payer impacts. As an example, when the water rate was last adjustment, adjusted in 2018, roughly $1.2 million a year was set aside to replace two miles of water mains. The current cost for completing that work has grown to over $2.2 million. You may ask why we don't reduce the amount of mains that we replace annually given the cost increases. That's because the town's water system has approximately 205 miles of water mains with an average expected life of 75 to 100 years. Therefore, it is critical that we replace on average two miles of main annually to ensure the functionality of the system. The debt funded approach is also more reliable, stable and affordable and equitable to ratepayers. Working with our team internally, and our financials advisors, we set a plan to make these critical capital investments while taking on associated debt with an average annual increase of less than 5% over the next five years. At this rate, the average residential water user would see their quarterly bill raise roughly $7 annually. So each quarter would go up by roughly $7. If we use a cash funded basis, rates would have to increase roughly 25% per year over this period and rate payers would experience roughly $35 per quarter. The equity of this approach is related to having rate payers who benefit from the investment over time pay their fair share rather than asking the current rate payers to foot the bill despite the life of the investment lasting in some cases more than 20 years. In consulting with the State Department of Revenue, other municipalities the size of Shrewsbury, we've learned that this change in approach is something all system faces face at some point. We have provided a list of planned investments on page 52 of your books for reference. 
There are other logistical benefits to this approach which may also yield savings. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about this initiative. Comments or questions with reference to Article 30? Right down front. Shannon Wall, Precinct 7. Um, can you please provide an update on the chemical PFAS in the water and how that will be addressed with this increase? Oh, Mr. Mr. Rowley, please. Ms. I would like Mr. Rowley to answer that question. Um, Dan Rowley, Water and Sewer Superintendent. Um, so we currently monitor PFAS on a monthly basis under regulations um, uh, developed by MassDEP, and they have a regulation for us to follow, um, which is there's six compounds, and we have to be under 20 nanograms per liter or parts per trillion. Um, we've consistently been under that since they put that regulation in place. We've, um, we've gone ahead. Shrewsbury's been proactive with, with PFAS since, um, you know, the summer of 2019 when they started testing for it. Um, we've gone ahead and we pilot tested for the removal. We had probably a little bit longer range plan to make the investment to add on to our treatment plant. Our existing facility will stay in use, um, biologically removing manganese. What you see in this article is a million dollars for us to go ahead and design that plant. We've already pilot tested. We have data on the, um, the different medias and how they perform with our water. Um, so we're gonna go into design and then we <coughs> hope to go to the state revolving fund to take advantage of those lower interest rates for um, PFAS removal. And um, unfortunately being under the 20 has, hasn't allowed us to, um, to, to be eligible for grants before, but with the, the federal government, I guess I should add this, the federal government back in March, added, they proposed different regulations that are a little more stringent than Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is the sum of six compounds. The federal government has proposed two compounds with a maximum contaminant level of four parts per trillion, and there's four other compounds where there's a hazard index and it's a bit of a formula. Unfortunately, we're slightly over that four parts per trillion. We're maybe five, five and, five and a half. Um, so that's why we're, we're looking to, to advance this in anticipation of those regulations taking effect. Square. Further comments or questions with reference to Mr. Adler? Thank you. Mark Adler, uh, Precinct 1. Um, I'm wondering about the language of the motion here. Uh, it says that among the, uh, in addition to the 80,000 for the, two, for the Port Farm Brook and the replacement truck, the 12 million, it says, is appropriated. Um, will that, uh, and it looks from the language in the description down below, that that would be um, uh, from borrowing. But is this all going to be held to the rate payers? I understand that the water rates are not uh, necessarily treated um, differently sometimes um, in the budget. So I just want to know, is this only going to be on the ratepayers or will this uh, come to the town? Thank you. Mr. Mizekar. Uh, rate, water rates only. Further comments or questions before we call Mr. Sigilnik? Mr. Sigilnik. The question is on the twelve million dollar borrowing. It it says that's, uh, you know, that's probably the right way to go to spread it out over time. But it says that's what we're going to spend over the next three years. So once we get beyond three years, does that mean to keep the water system up to date? We're going to be asking for like twelve million dollars every three or four years. Mr. Mizakar. So there will be um, a time for the next you know, five to six to eight years where we uh, will seek additional borrowing authorizations. Uh, the goal will always to be able to reasonably manage uh, the water rates to uh, keep it affordable. Um, as I answered on the, the previous article or two articles ago to Mr. Pitney's question, um, 
the funding source does not decline like a debt exclusion does under the general laws. So as we pay off the debt um, under these structures, we would have the ability to take on more capital investments. So th the rates would stay at a level. So I would see kind of um, a leveling out of the rate, you know, in the next, you know, eight years or so. But but. Yes, we are making this transition to the plan. The benefit, again, of, of doing that is that we're making these investments in the water system without uh, spiking the rate, you know, 25% or more um, to be able to cover these critical uh, improvements. So um, there's not always going to be this volume over a three-year period, but there will be those ongoing things, things like meter replacement and main replacement that, that will continue. Um, this plan, as you can see there, has some more one-time investments in some of our storage tanks and things like that, so that won't repeat. Um, but there is, a, there is a cycle associated with this, yes. But the rate will eventually be able to sustain itself. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 30? This article requiring a two-thirds vote. If there aren't any further comments or questions, we'll call the vote. Well, regarding Article 30, all those in favor of Article 30 shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Article 30 passes. Article 31. I move the printed motion under Article 31. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 31 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizikar. So town meeting members may recall action related to this project at last year's annual town meeting. Uh, but since then, we've uh, went through several more rounds of cost estimates and received approval from the MSBA through their accelerated repair program to fund 52.2% of this project. Unfortunately, the revised cost estimate is now nearly $4 million versus the million dollar preliminary estimate. Uh, the motion provides that we dedicate the previously voted funds to this project and allocate $1,472,990 that was originally borrowed but unexpended uh, from the Beale Elementary School project uh, that was referenced earlier. Given the performance of that project, there is currently $3,465,235 that was bar borrowed but not needed for the project. The final piece of this article is a $1,971,866 borrowing authorization. This amount represents the MSBA's grant that was approved for the project, so we never actually intend to borrow these funds. However, the MSBA requires that we local, locally appropriate the full project cost estimate to be eligible for their grant program. I'm happy to answer any questions. Town meeting members, any comments or questions? With reference to Article 31, Ms. Fritz. Sandra Fritz, Chair of the School Committee. On April 26, the School Committee voted unanimously to support this article. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments or questions with respect to this article? Not seeing or hearing any. This requiring a two-thirds vote. We'll now call the vote on Article 31. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, Article 31 passes. Article 32. I move the printed motion under Article 32. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 32 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizikar. Mr. Moderator, we've prepared several slides to detail uh, the project plans for this article, and I would ask for your permission to begin sharing those slides. Certainly. Why don't we get out of the way? Um, as uh, those are put up, uh, I will walk through some introductory comments, and then uh, Director of Public Works, Jeffrey Holland, will take a, two, a few minutes to detail this project in greater detail. This cemetery expansion project is proposed for 65 Prospect Street, which was originally recommended for cemetery expansion pur purposes through a report of the Land Oversight Committee at the May 1979 annual town meeting. We are now in the final window of time to provide for burials in Mount View Cemetery, and for the last few years, we have only sold lots upon the death of a resident. 
This plan sets forth an expanded cemetery that is designed to meet the burial responsibilities under the, of the town under the Massachusetts general laws for approximately 50 years, an estimated opening in calendar year 2025. Director Highland will talk about the design features, but prior to handling off, allow me to review the financial aspects of this article. This 4,370,000 investment is funded 60% through cash that's on hand and 40% through a new borrowing authorization, which totals $1,727,755. Relatively speaking, this is a small borrowing authorization for the town and the cash flow requirements for the project should allow us to use short-term notes, significantly reducing any interest paid. We are not, and I wanted to repeat, we are not seeking a debt exclusion authorization for this borrowing. Therefore, any debt service requirements would be funded through the base tax rate rather than a tax increase. I'll now turn it over to Director Highland to detail uh, the features associated with this uh, expansion project. Mr. Highland. Uh, Jeff Highland, DPW Director. Um, town meeting members, as we, we held a public hearing on this project several months ago to gather input. Uh, most of you know what Mountain View Cemetery looks like, which is um, direct burials or cat with caskets. This cemetery is intended to be a completely different look. Uh, we are designing the cemetery by keeping or trying to retain as much of the trees and landscaping and physical features as possible. It has stone walls, it has uh, mature trees. All of the trees within the say 23 acres, which includes part of the parkland, has been uh, flagged, identified, and, and evaluated so that the only trees that will be removed are the dead, dying, and diseased. The rest of the trees are to remain. The cemetery will consist of about 19 acres of the property, which is located at 65 Prospect Street at the corner of Merriam Ave and Prospect Street, so in that southern corner. Um, the project does include a sidewalk that will be internal to the cemetery that will go from the intersection of Spring Street and Prospect to allow access to the existing um, driveway to for the entrance to Prospect Park. It does include about a 28 parking spaces for Prospect Park, which is outside the limits of the 19 acres that are that is shown. And so the limits are shown on the map. It'll be just to the, the east of that is the new parking lot, which would be beyond, beyond, be beyond the gate that's there now. We chose the location to be up beyond the gate as we try to preserve, there's a good standing um, of pines that we elected to keep, and so the parking lot is beyond that. Uh, the lot is that we will be, or the cemetery will be broken into a bunch of different uh, sections, trying to look at the trends over time of the cemetery. Burials currently in Shrewsbury are mostly uh, casketed burials, though we are starting to see the trend of more and more cremations in other alternatives. Uh, though Sh uh, Shrewsbury currently lags behind in most of uh, New England, but in Eastern Mass we are starting to see more cremations, more actually burials with the pets also being part of it, or uh, etc. cetera. Uh, this cemetery, if anyone's been, seen, been to Mount Auburn Cemetery, this cemetery is being proposed to be very similar. The design is to look very similar. Burials within the trees, burials within the stone wall areas. Uh, there will be some sections that will be uh, the standard burials, but as the trends change over the next 50 years, the cemetery will be able to morph and sort of change the areas of the types of burials. Um, The cemetery, we are looking at putting in a feature such as a potential gazebo. Um, 
sort of in the center of it. There's a, a sort of like a cul-de-sac, and that will be the area of a potential gazebo. We realize that there are wetlands on the site, and we are uh, working with that to try to enhance that area as a um, kind of a memorial or a um, some sort of water feature. The, we will have a small office on the site along with a maintenance garage. The maintenance garage will be separate with a, a separate uh, controlled entrance off of Boylston Street. Um, the sales office will have a central uh, um, location off of Prospect Street. There's one entrance into the cemetery, which is off Prospect. Um, and it will have a walking path, as I said, over to uh, Prospect Park. Um, the intent of the cemetery, the way it's being designed, is for the cemetery to have a park-type feeling, so where the cemetery and parks commission is encouraging people to, be, to use that not only as Prospect Park Park, but almost an extension of it. It's, it's a, the look is not going to be like mountain, the existing Mountain View, but more as, as a park. And that was, that's the intent, and that's the design. The design will be about 3,200 burial uh, plots, which, which should um, cover the town for, for the next 50 years or so. And I'll open it up for any questions or to the moderator. Are you done? Presentation done? Yes. Thank you. Comments or questions with reference to, excuse me. Article 32. Good evening, Ms. Swydan. Hi, Carol Swydan, Precinct 6. Um, if you have a cemetery, if you have plots in Mountain View, can you also put cremated, use cremated cremation um, urns in, in Mountain View? Yes. Or it's not allowed? Mr. Howland? Uh, they are allowed at Mountain View. Okay. Further comments or questions? Just a second. Right up there, I'm pointing at you. You're, you're the one, yes. Couldn't see your face. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I have. Um, may I ask two questions? Just you certainly can. Thank you. Can you locate where the pergola is on this diagram? Sure. So the pergola is on the on the map that's up there. Is at the top of the plan, near the top. That's not the water tower. There's two water towers, and the pergola is up near the water tower. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, cemeteries often will, well, typically have a space where uh, yeah. mowing, you know, grasses are, are kept and, and dirt is moved around. Where will that be in this plan? So currently we are in the design process. We're about 10% into the actual design, and that is a key component that we will be designing as part of the uh, cemetery expansion uh, design plans. So you, we we do realize that that is an issue, and we will make sure that it's not, it'll be separate away from, it definitely won't be near, in the park or near the park, but it'll be in a location designated away from uh, the, the uh, cemetery plots. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Mr. Molina. Jason Molina, Precinct 1. Um, are there, I, I heard you mention sidewalks, but is it, it sounds like it's just limited around one intersection. Would there be sidewalks at all through the, at least, I know not the interior, but let's say roadside on Prospect Street? Any, any con possibility of doing that? Mr. Howland? So the, the proposal on this particular project, at least currently, is to provide a sidewalk that will go, uh, do we have a different, yep. yep. 
Perfect. So right now, the entrance will, will utilize the existing entrance that's at, on Prospect Street, and then there's actually an opening in the stone wall, almost opposite of Spring Street. So we will connect a sidewalk from the crosswalk that's, or from the end of the sidewalk that's Spring Street and Prospect, and we'll run it through the cemetery as the, there's a very limited space between the existing road and the, and the uh, stone wall. So in, to try to preserve the stone wall, we're gonna put the sidewalk within the cemetery property, and then we're gonna run that, we'll cross the side, the uh, access road of the cemetery, and then we'll actually tie into this, the uh, roadway to Prospect Park itself. Follow up? Certainly. And I know this is designed about the, the capital improvements here. I think this is more of a policy thing. I think there's an opportunity here to since there's going to be sidewalks internally and there's not going to be one on prospect you have a lot of runners on our community that may be looking to take advantage for a safe passage instead of running right on the road um, through this section so uh, this may be some usage conflicts here between runners and um, those that want to use a cemetery for their cemetery purposes so the purpose of this sidewalk really is for multi-purpose i think it w i think it's currently designed at eight feet wide and it'll be a paved, paved uh, walkway. Uh, so it's, it's, we know that we want people to, we're encouraging people to walk a from the town center to Prospect Park, but we're also, it, it, it's, there's a 50 foot landscape buffer before the cemetery starts along uh, Spring, uh, Prospect Street. And the idea is to keep it within that space so there's no conflict between cemetery and uh, runners, walkers, kids on bikes, et cetera. Awesome, thank you. Mr. Mizikar. If, if I may, so I just wanna to point to where the sidewalk is proposed so I understand Mr. Molina's comments. Although we would love to have it right up against the roadway, but we don't wanna destroy the, the rock wall that's there, so it will be parallel to the road. You know, the entire, the entire, length, of the, the entire length of the property uh, so we can, so it, we're doing the best that we can to site a sidewalk to provide for safe passage along Prospect Street. Sounds great, and thank you for saving the, the rock well as well. Thank you. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 32? Did you want to follow up? Yes. Diane Jones, Precinct 8. Uh, so I, I was a little unclear on what I was hearing. Once all of this is designed, will there be the possibility in the future that um, like sections of it will come down and, and be, become a place for other uh, plots or will it remain like this? Mr. Howland? It, it will, it will remain. No, Mr. Mr. It, it will remain uh, more of a natural feature with mature trees uh, so we will not be clear cutting areas, you know, to uh, look, look more like the newer sections of Mountain View. It will be much more uh, full of trees and natural features. So those integrated areas, if we could zoom in on this, we have more detailed maps we'd be happy to share with you, uh, provide for 50 years of burials in a very natural landscape like this, as Director Howland said, just like Mount mm -hmm. Auburn Cemetery uh, in the town of Arlington. Further comments or questions with reference? Ms. Hilton? Um, so Prospect Park, Bridget Hilton, Precinct 7. Um, Prospect Park is one of my favorite places in town and I'm just wondering for those of us who enjoy it as a place of recreation and um, reflection, will there be a separate entrance so that we don't have to take the kids through the graveyard to get to the park, or is it just one? Mr. Howland? Uh, there is, so the existing Prospect Park entrance will remain. It, it will be enhanced a little bit just to provide easier access, and the Cemetery Act driveway will actually be a little bit closer to the center of town. Um, so yes, there are, will be two separate entrances. Comments or questions with reference to Article 32, way up back, sir. 
Oh, do you have a sticker on, sir? Oh. Okay, Under the great. jacket. Uh, my name is Carter Hall, Precinct 6. Um, just some stats that I was looking up regarding the cemetery. Uh, so, in 2015, according to the National Funeral Directors Association, about 50% of uh, funerals were cremations, 50% were burials. But you extrapolate that to a few years out, you know, 2040 might be looking like 15% are burials, 85% are cremations. So do we think that this project uh, is worth the cost for, for that projection? Mr. Howland. Uh, so Shrewsbury and New England is closer to 70% burials and 30% cremations. Yes, that number is changing, uh, but currently New England is, ten, is lagging behind the national standard. So yes, we do believe that this is the proper. Now, that doesn't say that over the, you know, the next 10, 20, 30 years, as burial trends change, then the Parks and Cemetery Commission can be still changing uh, it's sort of the, the locations at this, the new cemetery of where potential different types of burials will take place. Further comments or questions with reference to this? Any new folks that I haven't called on before? Right behind Missy. Hi, Stefan Hess, Precinct 8, uh, 33 Spring Street, so five houses away. I um, maintain Seattle Trail, maintain part of Miriam. I'm for this project. I think it's the right thing. I love the considerations, so thank you. Um, the second thing, though, the transfer of 650000 from Article 6, the bridge reconstruction. Could you explain that, please? Mr. Mizakar. Sure, so we, we use proceeds from the sale of Centec North uh, to move forward with the reconstruction of the Toblin Hill Bridge project. We put roughly $2 million in place. Uh, subsequent to that town meeting, we hit a very favorable bid environment. So that project is moving forward and construction is actually under mobilization and, and has started uh, this spring. So we just don't need those funds any longer. So the project came in at about $1.3 million. So we can free those funds up and use that cash on hand for this project. Further comments or questions with reference to this article? Ms. Hollenbeck. Lisa Hollenbach, Precinct 9. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. There were other hands. Thank you for calling on me. Um, so I appreciate all the, the extra work and planning that has gone into this. Um, so some of my thoughts and questions um, kind of rely on the gentleman before is that the population of Shrewsbury is approximately 30% Southeast Asian, again, um, with different um, burial techniques than most you know, traditional New Englanders. Um, and that's likely to continue into the future as we attract um, people from all over the world in Shrewsbury. Um, so that might change the demographics. But the question I have is, so when you had that map there, the different lovely sections and the features and stuff, how does one choose where they want to be in the cemetery? Is there, are you just opening certain sections? Like section one will be available in, from 2025 to 2040 or whatever. Or do people get to choose? Like, I want to be way up here on this part, and somebody else wants to be way down here, because that means that the, the, the park is constantly being disturbed, like constantly various parts are being dug up and cars and that kind of thing. Or is it done by sections? And the other thing is, um, this might sound strange, but you know, I've got a business mind here, and we are town meeting. Um, are certain plots going to be more expensive because they're in a more lovely spot? Um, you know, little things like that. So I know I've got a lot of big question answers. There, Mr. Howland. Uh, the cost issue will be dictated by the Parks and Cemetery Commission. Um, th they have not considered the costs at this point. Uh, the locations, 
the, the way the cemetery is being designed currently is there will be certain sections for certain types of burials, uh, and then it will be the Parks and Cemetery Commission will dictate, or not dictate where, which type of burial you have, but there will be certain sections that may be um, uh, you know, a direct burial. There will be some that are, are uh, cremation lots. There may be some that are dual. There will be some that are more in the trees itself. There will be some that are in the walls. And those will be, you pick and choose which, what area. If you want to be near a stone wall, then you find a spot it near Stonewall. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 32? Sir. Anand Sarma, Precinct 9. Uh, I have comment and suggestion also. As most of the uh, time meeting member described, like the Asian community is increasing around this uh, town of Shrewsbury. I would have suggestion like uh, we can also consider installing installing the cement, uh, cremation plant also, and that will uh, generate the revenue also for town. So in place of putting the whole uh, place for uh, like a uh, burial place, we can have a uh, uh, cremation plant or furnace. Not basically like a uh, third party can install it; they can generate revenue for the town too. Thank you, um, Kevin. I'm going to refer that one to Kevin Esposito, who, who's our Mr. Parks, Esposito, who's our Parks and Cemetery uh, uh, Division Manager, uh, ma mainly because uh, he works with the Parks and Cemetery Commission more than I do. Can, can, can you repeat the question? Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, my question is that, like in place of the. We are install, We have a, a cemetery also. We can have side by side a cremation plant also. The furnace which is used uh, to uh, cremation. But because I noticed most of the folks who is living in the Surishwari or around the town, they are going to the New Hampshire for doing the cremation. Because we don't have anything around the, in, uh, the central Massachusetts, even the Boston also. Even Boston, uh, Boston and other places, those are also going to the New York side. Is that as much a question or a desire that it's, the policy be taken under consideration? The suggestion for town. So because that way we can have more revenue because okay. the community is growing, people are need that one, so we could go for that. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Further co uh, questions or comments down front? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Shen Wall, Precinct 7. Um, I know I asked this on the last town meeting. I understand this decision was made 44 years ago. The needs of the town have really changed. This is a very beloved park, and at any time of the day, you can see it being very actively used. Um, my, my question is really regarding the exploration of other space for burials for many reasons. One traffic and congestion in a very residential area. I don't know if you've tried to get out of Prospect Street around 3.30 <clears throat> to 5 o'clock. It's nearly impossible. Um, it's very actively used. There's many number of health benefits, mental health benefits, which we know from the pandemic is something that needs to be top of mind for everybody. Um, and it's at the center of town. And this space could really be used in many recreational ways that could actually provide a steady flow of income to the town uh, versus having it be used for a cemetery. <clears throat> so my question is again, as it was the last meeting, since the last meeting, have we explored any other alternative space for a cemetery? Mr. Mizikar. Alex, you got a slide six, please. So in short, no. Um, we have followed the direction of this town meeting, uh, which has provided funding to us on two separate occasions over the last 10 years to continue to pursue these efforts for cemetery expansion at Prospect uh, 65 Prospect Street. Uh, the limitations of this cemetery proposal this evening, which seeks to be solidified through the following article, Article 33, is the use of 19 acres uh, re leaving a remaining balance of roughly 77 acres undisturbed and dedicated to parkland. So we feel that uh, given the feedback that we've received from this body, through the community, through very other, various other outreach efforts related to this project, that we're striking a balance. 
uh, identifying uh, the long-term direction that this property has been discussed and reviewed by this body on several occasions, meeting the needs of the community for burials and our obligations under the general law, and providing uh, long-term preservation of, again, nearly 70 uh, plus acres of, of for uh, parkland purposes uh, with affirmation through next article. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 32? There's a new one. Good evening. Patricia Minton, Precinct 7. So I agree with Ms. Wall that other, um, I agree with Ms. Wall that we should uh, look for other alternatives. Uh, I did go to the Board of Selectmen and um, explain my point of view. Um, anyway, I just really think that for personal space and town recreation, we should keep Prospect Park as it is, but anyway. So what will happen to the displaced wildlife with the new proposed cemetery? So, so the design Alan. of the, the design of the cemetery is to try to enhance some of the wildlife, as we are not clear cutting the property. Most of the tr uh, lo mature trees will main be maintained, and the histo history of Mount Auburn is the wildlife in Mount Auburn is fairly plentiful. Follow up. I'm sorry. Um, another question. Will these uh, burial plots, will you have to d die prior to purchasing them, or can you pre-purchase them? So, so policy question, Mr. Mizikar? Yeah, so the intention, uh, again, the reason that we've limited sales at Mountain View is because of the limitation, and this would open us up for, a future, for more planning uh, for residents to buy them, not on an immediate need basis. Thank you. Further comments or questions, Ms. Deering? Correct me if I'm wrong, and, and I refer to Mr. Byrne, who might remember this, but I believe when we acquired this property in the first place, it was with the intent of having an expansion of the cemetery there when we acquired this entire piece of property. And if you would correct me, Mr. Byrne, if I'm wrong? Mr. Mizikar, can you answer that yeah, question? Yeah, I can provide some background. So um, the report uh, that was issued to uh, this uh, body in 1979 recommended that it be used uh, for cemetery purposes. It was originally bought in uh, 1976 uh, for, quote, playground purposes. So those are the, the official. Um, so there was a report read in 1979 that made that recommendation by the Land Oversight Committee. Mr. Byrne, do you have anything to offer in the way of historic perspectives? <laughs> Could we have a microphone for Mr. Byrne, please? Thank you. By the way, I'd like to take this moment to thank Mark Sarah and his whole crew and the volunteers for running from hither and there to make this possible. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Byrne. Potter, uh, my name is Kevin Byrne. I live in Precinct 6. I've always lived in Precinct 6. After Precinct 6, I'm going to, I'm going to live at one of these cemeteries up in the center of town. Okay. Uh, my, wife my wife suggests maybe sooner than later, but that's up to her. Uh, just a little bit of institutional memory. Uh, in 1976, Mr. Moderator, that's 1976. Uh, I was standing where you're standing now because I was the town moderator in 1976. Uh, every time I, I say that to people and I say, you know, I, I was elected moderator in 1974, and every time I talk to all of our new, uh, obviously young town meeting members, and I tell them, <coughs> You don't remember me, but I was a town moderator. I was elected in 1974. 
where were you in 1974? And three quarters of you in this room didn't even exist in 1974. Okay. In 1976, this came up uh, for the first time. Uh, and it came up because it was owned by the Masons, by the Masonic uh, order or some fashion, because there was a nursing home on it. That, and she worked there for two years in 1976. Uh, it came up at that point, and the deal was, what should we do with it? They wanted to sell it. Uh, and uh, if I remember correctly, um, the big issue we had back then was not that we needed to buy it, and not that it was going to be designated in part uh, as a uh, as a cemetery, because that was even brought up in 1976. The deal at that point that we had a little bit of an argument on town meeting is cost. That's all we were talking about. You know, it's too expensive. Uh, the finance committee that I had in 1974 uh, were somewhat conservative. <laughs> they were all very conservative. Anyway, then again in 1979, it came up again, and we were talking about money. And at that time, basically, we were talking about a beautiful piece of property that we didn't own, that we were going to buy, uh, but what were we going to do with the building that was on it? Uh, so there was a committee that was put together. Uh, and I think uh, I might have appointed that committee in 1979. And the purpose of it is, is there any way we could use this building that was there? It was an old mansion, uh, and it has been used as a nursing home. And the committee, uh, the what? The Whittall Mansion. <laughs> Uh, but the committee that was appointed, probably by the selectmen, maybe by me, spent a lot of time at it, and they said, you know, this, you know could, could the town use it for any purposes? And the answer to it is, uh, they couldn't figure out anything that we would be able to use it for or to do with it. And it also was in terrible shape, and it, uh, it eventually was <coughs> torn down, I think, by the town at that stage. So right from the very beginning, there was never any question back into the dark prehistoric ages that this was land that was designated in part uh, for cemetery purposes. Um, um, and that's where I will wind up, Mr. Badger. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Further comments or questions? There were a couple of hands up. There are new, any new hands right down front. Yes. You. <clears throat> I'm Carolyn McAdam, Princeck 3. My question is, will there be some sort of a wall or something so people, can, when they go in to enjoy the park, won't feel like they're in a cemetery? Will there be some sort of a separation? Mr. Howland? Can you, can you repeat that question? Yeah. Come into the park. Will there be some sort of a wall or something where oh, the graves oh, are, okay. so people can enjoy it without feel like they're in the graveyard? Mr. Howland, can you go back to the picture, uh, the first one, right there? So, so there will actually be a very a wide landscape buffer between the park entrance and the cemetery. Majority of the the park and the tr existing trails are well beyond the limits of the cemetery. So we're gonna maintain that landscaping. Further comments or questions? Ms. Petrucci. Hi, Melanie Petrucci, Precinct One. I'd like to move the question. Motion has been made and seconded to move the question. This we have to go to an immediate vote and it is not subject to debate. If you are supportive of ending debate, you will vote yes to move the question. If you are not, you will vote no. I ask that you please use your regular voices. On the uh, motion to end debate, all those in favor shall signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Debate has ended on Article 32. On Article 32, requires <laughs> a two-thirds vote. 
I'm going to call the roll, uh, call the vote on Article 32. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. no. Two thirds passes. Article 33. I move the printed motion under Article 33. Second. Finance Committee. Finance Committee recommends passage of Article 33 by a vote of 7 to 0. Mr. Mizikar. Um, as I mentioned during the discussion under the previous article, <coughs> through Article 33, we're seeking to <coughs> affirm the use of oh, land um, within 65 Prospect Street for the purposes designated uh, within the handout that's been provided to you this evening. So 19 acres for cemetery purposes and perpetually reserving the balance of the land, which is not set aside for water or roadway purposes for parkland. Comments or questions with reference to Article 33? Mr. Molina. Jason Molina, Precinct 1. So I, I want to thank you all for proposing this opportunity, hearing the community input about what to do with balance of Prospect Park. Obviously, we heard some voices tonight about uh, not looking to have a cemetery there at all. Uh, but I think, um, I think this is a time where I think we're ju jumping the gun a bit on this. Um, I think that we really need to see what the park-like experience of a cemetery is before we go ahead and make a, de a dedication for the balance of Prospect Park to be uh, a parkland. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, certainly I, I'm one for having open spaces, but I think we really need to understand what this looks like, how it feels before we do this. Um, you know, we heard this being a 50-year cemetery and I would say one we really should be leaving this decision for a future town meeting to make the best decision in their perspective after experiencing what is what are the real trends of burials at, at that time whether it be 10 20 30 years from now I mean certainly um, you know as there's conversation about what can we do like 50 years ago talking about um, what can we do with the White Whitehall um, uh, mansion. Well, geez, if, they had, if that decision was coming up today, we would be talking about CPA as having an opportunity to preserve and protect historic assets. So, you know, I really think that, um, I think this is something we really should be leaving this for a future town meeting to make that decision. Um, and, 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 you know, the thing is this, the balance of this parcel is already town owned, right? We decide here, we all decide here what we're going to do with that parcel. There's no risk to keeping it the way it is right now. So I, I'm asking that we don't approve this. Thank you. I'm in receipt of a letter from Kevin J. Esposito, Parks and Cemetery Maintenance Division man, man, excuse me, Manager, regarding Article 33. In it, he writes, the police be advised that at a special meeting held on May 12, 2023, the Parks and Cemetery Commission voted 2-0 to approve the transfer of approximately 19 acres portion of town-owned property at 65 Prospect Street to cemetery purposes and the approximately 52.5 acre portion of the property to park purposes consistent with the plan entitled Article 33 Mountain View Cemetery Expansion on file in the clerk's office and I believe you saw it this evening. Further comments or questions regarding Article 33? Not seeing, oh, wait a second, new, a new gentleman down front, Mr. Cray. Robert Cray, Precinct 2. I just wanted to echo the comments of the previous resident that would, based on the amount of questions raised, many of which were fair and reasonable, that additional time would be well spent in turning this over to a further uh, public comment. And it also seems, as a resident of Precinct 2, I'm bothered by the financing from the prior article. I was not able to, to speak to that. 
but I do think that the people who voted for school money never anticipated that, that money was going to be rolled over into a cemetery. I think the plan has all great benefits, and I hope that Mr. Howland uh, gets his day. He did some awesome work be uh, benchmarking out there with Mount Auburn uh, Cemetery, and he he's done some excellent work there that I hope everyone respects and gives him his shot. But I, I do think that the prior comment was a little more articulate than mine, that uh, the process could use a little more input. Thank you. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 33? Did he? Dating got it. Precinct two. What kind of financial impact are we looking at for this? Like, Mr. What's Mizukar. the scope of this? So the, there's no <coughs> cost associated with Article 33, so we don't need any funding. Um, it's just memorializing the use that's proposed through the maps, and would be in accordance with what was approved with Article 32. So no additional financial implications for Article 33. Article. 33, any further comments or questions? Ms. Nichols. Dean and Nichols, Precinct 7. So if we just approved the funding of $4,370,000 for the cemetery to be done, or not to be done, to be developed, I guess the language said, um, and this was voted down the following article, what type of impact would that have on expending the monies that we just voted to put into the budget for that project? 33 is done. Mr. Mizikar? Hold on. 32. 32. We just so 32, voted, excuse 32. me. 32. We just voted 32. Hold on. There's something going on up here. What's going on? Uh, it's sure. It's on. it's on now. Uh, if I may, Mr. Moderator, uh, Stephen Madaus, Town Council. The uh, 19 acres must be held for cemetery purposes to expend those funds that were just approved to make cemetery improvements. So if, if portions are to be held, the 19 acres shouldn't be held if you want those funds to be expended for those improvements. At least that should be transferred to cemetery purposes. Thank you. Um, could I, well, my other question I had hoped you would ask was about how that money was going to be used, uh, but that's the prior article we already voted on, so. Yes, we did. Thank you. Further questions on Article 33 to designate the balance of Prospect Park for park purposes? Any new questions? If not, Mr. Molina. So I'm a leader pricing one. So unfortunately, are you saying, I, Mr. Moderator, through you, are, are we hearing that you have to vote yes for, in order for the prior article to be approved? In, in the current structure, the way it's written, without getting the into prior the prior article is approved. No, it, it sounded like from the comment from the response of the last question was that in order to get funding for the cemetery part, this article has to be approved in order to get the 19 acres set as cemetery and the balance. So are we locked into Time a decision. Out. One second. Council. Prior article. Steve, I want to ask you a question. Oh. <laughs> yep, very good. Mr. Molini, a question once again. Does this article need to be approved in order to have the prior article go into effect? <clears throat> yes. You, we may not expend funds to build out a cemetery on land that's not held for cemetery purposes. So this second article was to, is to transfer the 19 acres to cemetery purposes, which could be built out with the funds as approved by the prior article and then the 52.5 acres would be transferred to park purposes. So those cemetery funds improvements can't be expended unless the 19 acres is held for that purpose. 
Good. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to go into revising, but thank you. And I will vote yes for this. Thank you. Further comments or questions with respect to Article 33? Not seeing or hearing any. We'll call this vote. This requires what? I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Yes, sir. Raju Palavati, Precinct 4. I mean, my story here, since last summer, I have been going to Prospect Park um, to volunteer. And, um, and what seems to be a really neglected park, we're trying to bring it to you know, some, some kind of a park-like scenario where everyone <coughs> of our children, I mean, uh, some of our children could go there and enjoy themselves. So what I would, I agree with Mr. Molina that we need to take uh, another step back and try to look at it holistically because as a town we have not really expanded, uh, I mean, uh, worked on the park nor, you know, um, spent any time or money on it. So we should reconsider this decision and try to step back and work on it again. Miss, uh, Mr. Mizakar. The bike's not working. Can I clarify something? So we are trying to designate the balance of this park as an official park within the community, which it is not right now. So if it's designated as a park, then it would be an invested in as in a park. So I understood your comments to be opposite of that. So we are, are, are looking to designate a portion of this property for cemetery purposes and for park purposes. So moving it into park sets it aside and then provides opportunity for park-like investments there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very good point there. Follow up? Yes. Um, very good point there. Um, I understand that f only 15% of the park is right now being allocated for uh, cemetery expansion. And uh, would it mean that the funds that would come from the <coughs> cemetery expansion would actually help I mean, develop the park, is there, what, how much of the development of the cemetery, the funds being allocated would go into development of the park as well? So these are the questions that need no. to be answered. None. None. What, what you approved, uh, what the body just approved was for that area of the cemetery, not the entire area. It's for that project. I understand. So, okay. uh, Mr. Mizikar's uh, point that uh, now it would be, uh, assigned under the parks committee, the prospect park, the remainder of the park, would it mean that more fund would go into development of the park? Potentially. Right now there's no opportunity to do that. So that's exactly my point. Maybe we need to revisit this. I, I, I completely agree that 15% is worth giving away towards the cemetery when there's more funds coming into development of the rest of the park. Maybe that is the reason why I want to step back and maybe give the broader picture. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments or questions with reference to Article 33? Not seeing or hearing any, this requiring a two-thirds vote. We'll now move to the vote. Article 33. All those in favor of Article 33 shall signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. no. It carries with two thirds. Article 34, a citizen's petition. The town's general bylaws provide the moderator may decline to allow a motion which may be declared illegal by town council. By letter dated April 4th, 2023, town council reported his determination that a motion under Article 34 is legally impermissible. A copy of that letter was made available to each of you in your packet. Therefore, I declare Article 34 to be out of order and no action shall be taken thereto. We'll now move to Bundle 20, Articles. It's 1028. I was having fun. <laughs> well, let me go a few pages. 
It's actually 1020, isn't it? 1028. Come on. Okay, town meeting members, the hour of 1030 or close enough is upon us. In accordance with the procedural motion adopted at the start of the meeting, we may not take up any new article unless you decide otherwise. I'm advised by town manager Mizaka that this auditorium is available to us tomorrow evening, Tuesday, May 16th at 7 p.m. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting to Tuesday, May 16th at 7 p.m. in this building, in this auditorium? Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. All those opposed, have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow night.